Okay, we're live. Um, the Environment, Economic Development, and Agriculture Division for Wednesday, April 8th, 2015 will come to order. Um, you know, most guys just go there a little bit of starts rather than winter housekeeping. Um, we have a new page. Coley, would you like to stand up and wave to everybody? <laughs> Coley Colburn. Um, where are you from, man? From Senator Scalzi, this oh, madness height. Yes. Did, yeah, did, did you recommend her? No, I'm no? just thrilled that she's here, though. Oh, yeah, you're supposed to thanks. say yes, I'm responsible for it. Yes. <laughs> Nobody's ever responsible. <laughs> um, and just a little bit of um, information for the members of the committee if you uh, have bills that you think you need hearings on, um, or you have put in a hearing request and you think you need to get a hearing, let Scott know. And we'll try and fit things in as well as we can. I think what we're going to try and do, if the staff has the ability to do so, is that sometimes next Wednesday, I think we'll try and roll out the uh, draft of what the omnibus bill will look like. That'll be the 15th, if we can, if we can pull it off with the, uh, with the various amount of work that these guys have to do. So we'll see if, if we can get it done by then. And then my plan would be to uh, actually have um, a hearing on it on Thursday the 16th and pass it out of the committee that day. And then I think we end up in finance on Monday the 20th. So that's kind of what my, my plan is now. Whether or not we can logistically get it done, I'm not sure. So it all depends on how many hearings or how many bills we have and how many hearings we're going to how much time we have to take in these hearings. But we're going to hear as many bills as we possibly can, and then we'll do what we can. Um, um, just an, another one of uh, an in, interesting part of the committee is that we have about $800 million in requests, and they, they're still coming in, and our budget target is $45 million. So um, we, we don't exactly know how we're going to fit all that in yet either. So, uh, you know, Schmidt wants all the money for broadband, and so... <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll, <laughs> We'll see how this all goes. So anyway, um, that's just a, a little uh, short primer on what's coming up for the next couple of weeks here. Um, there's some bills like, uh, like Senator Schmidt, you have the fishing game bill, like that doesn't have to be heard before the deadline. And uh, like the LCCMR bill, that doesn't have to be heard before the deadline. So we're not gonna be hearing those bills. And there's also a few other bills that uh, maybe won't travel with the omnibus bill, but could travel by themselves that may or may not be heard before the before we do this. So um, we'll, get, we'll get that all straightened out with all of you that are on the committee that uh, need to hear bills and wanna uh, see if we can get it into the omnibus bill. So we'll, we'll go from there. So. Um, Senator Conan, Senate File 1749. Welcome. We, we share an office and we never even see each other. What the heck? It's like, it's like my neighbors on 2nd Street in Chisholm. We all go out the back door so we never see each other across the street. <laughs> yes, it's, it's, the next question, Mr. Chair, is that intentional? Well, <laughs> it's where the garage is. So you always go out the back door to the car. Well, it looks like Senator Schmidt's going aid incognito. He's, yeah, he's, he's, he's putting on the hockey beard. You, you, or the professor look, one or the other. Yeah. You never yeah. know. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, our offices don't have back doors. So I don't know what's <laughs> we, still don't see, we still don't see each other. <laughs> no trap doors either? <laughs> It's got to go other places to see each other. But, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for hearing this bill. Um, uh, this, this bill is about food hubs and alternative food distribution systems. It's Senate File 1749, and I do have an amendment that, that I would like uh, um, the committee to uh, adopt. It's the A1 amendment. Oh, good. And a quorum is present, so that's good. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, so um, Senator Sparks moves the A1 amendment. Uh, this is an authorized amendment, so all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion is adopted. Go ahead. Um, all right, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman and committee members. Uh, Senate File 1749 requests an appropriation to the Department of Agriculture for grants to develop or expand food hubs in Minnesota. Of the appropriation, 300000 is for grants through the Department of Agriculture. 
and 50,000 is appropriated to the commissioner to consult with existing food hubs and alternative community food-based distribution uh, systems. And the amendment that was just uh, adopted um, on lines uh, 1.12 adds in the uh, University of Minnesota Extension Service. Uh, a portion of this money, of the money in this bill is appropriated to look at best practices in the state and to use uh, those models on projects going forward. The U of M Extension Program has uh, done a lot of good work on this issue, and uh, so it would be good to include them uh, in the discussion of these best practices. <coughs> these food hubs provide help for small and mid-sized ag producers with uh, aggregating, marketing, and distributing their produce to different outlets within our communities. Um, food hubs, as well as uh, CSAs, the Community Support Agriculture, have received funding in the past from the Agri-Fund program. There's a strong uh, movement in favor of these food hubs in Minnesota. In my district, for example, Wilmer has been working on a project as part of their downtown development to set up a food hub along with a commercial kitchen to help local producers process and distribute their food. And uh, I think there's a map in your folders that uh, shows where some of the food hubs are uh, located around the state. Part of what they do here is to help the small and medium-sized producers with the, the, uh, the, the aggregation and marketing. And some of the places that the food is being marketed is schools, restaurants, they're working on hospitals, and uh, developing uh, other delivery systems. Uh, develop, there's also the model of developing local retail outlets, for example, uh, co-op grocery stores. Uh, there's also uh, uh, food hubs that aggregate product and deliver to the metro area, and that's especially important for producers in rural parts of the state that have uh, 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 low populations in their counties. Uh, some also develop commercial kitchens to help with food uh, processing and preparation and then also developing uh, uh, some storage. That would be large uh, refrigerators for cooling or uh, freezers. And that's uh, the bill, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any questions or comments? Anybody that needs to testify on you have You have no scheduled testifiers, right? So, okay. Any questions or comments from the committee? All right, and seeing none, um, Senator Coonan, that was an easy one. We'll lay it over for possible inclusion All right. in the omnibus bill, and then you have Senate File 1271. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Senate File 1271 is the uh, Livestock Industry Study Bill. And this bill, this is the first engrossment uh, of this bill. Uh, this bill instructs the Commissioner of Agriculture to study the growth or decline of ag animal agriculture in Minnesota and the surrounding states over the last 10 years. It further instructs the Commissioner to identify the cause of that growth or decline. And f uh, finally, the Department is asked to uh, include the, uh, in the report the number of livestock farms in each uh, state during that same time. And if you look at the bill, you can see there on line 1.6, uh, starting there, the, the states that uh, will, the study will be done in is Minnesota, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, and Nebraska. And uh, also the commissioner is required to, to provide recommendations how to strengthen and expand uh, Minnesota animal agriculture, and, and that report would be to legislative committees with uh, juris jurisdiction over agriculture policy and finance. And so that's the bill, Mr. Chairman. Um, no? Uh, Senator Conan, I'm just curious because, <coughs> see what, this one is 50,000, 40,000, what is it? Oh, the 25,000. 25, yes. 25,000 for a study that's going to go over to Iowa, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And the commissioner needs 50,000 on your previous bill. Do you, do you have any idea why <coughs> that is like that? Well, 
But I, I, you know, I'm maybe I don't know if the department wants to comment, but the, the way I understand it is that uh, the, the previous bill, there's a lot of new work to be done there to discover what's going on. With this one, this information is pretty much available in each of the states. It's a matter of compiling it and, ma and getting the report ready for the legislature. They can, they can do it mostly on a website. Is that kind of what you're thinking, or? I don't know if there's anybody here from the department to answer that, but I would suspect that a lot of it's available that way. Okay. That way yeah. So in the previous bill, is, the, is, is, is there any indication that the 50000 is for a new employee for the commissioner or no? What, what is, maybe I should ask this when you're doing the other bill, but go, as long as you're up, go ahead and say your name for the record, please. Um, my name is Mary Hanks. I'm the director of ag marketing and development at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Um, when we prepared the fiscal note, and I, I believe the fiscal note, I don't know what's over there, but was $40,000 and we could absorb 15000 of it. Um, we anticipated uh, doing a lot of the work through various um, economic databases using our ag statistician and um, then possibly um, contracting with the university uh, Center for Farm Financial Management to help us pull additional data together. Uh, it's not a new employee. Um, we would use ex existing staff uh, for most of it. That's on this bill, but how about the previous bill where the um, there's uh, 350,000 for the bill and then 50,000 for the commissioner? And Oh, I'm that, sorry, that, I misunderstood. No, 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 you answered, oh, you answered, you answered the okay. first half of my question. I answered okay. okay, go ahead. Um, and the food hub, um, you know, $50,000 for the commissioner but would be very adequate. No, but I mean, is that a new employee or is No, it would not be a new employee. What would you be doing with that money? Uh, we would probably, um, again, possibly contract with, um, say, the regional sustainable development partnerships who are very, very involved in working with food hubs already, um, have connections with, with all of them and those who are planning them, and ask them to do um, some of that work of working with the food hubs to find out what their needs are. Okay. Are there any questions, uh, Senator Weber? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, have, uh, I have an oral amendment to propose to this bill. I believe that there's been communication with Senator Coonan as the author of the bill, and this was also added in the House, and this would uh, uh, bring, the, um, bring this bill into the same language. Uh, the amendment would be on going to page 1, line 7, before the period, insert these words including but not limited to the impact of nuisance lawsuits filed against poultry or livestock farms. Um, and Senator Weber, we have... We oh, have you do have it prepared. Have a I'm prepared, sorry. Prepared amendment here so we can pass it out. Um, go ahead and you can continue to comment on it though. Okay, and, and basically uh, this, uh, it follows uh, some uh, discussion that has been had uh, in, in the Ag Committee actually uh, and, is actually, and talking about uh, what impact some of these lawsuits uh, that, that have occurred uh, regard, in, in the poultry and livestock industry, uh, what impact they do have on the industry itself. And, um, and so uh, it would just be another area uh, which the study is to cover. Have you seen this, Senator Conner? I have. So, so, so this, to this point? Well, Senator Dibble. The, I was just going to ask if Senator Coonan supports this. Like, yeah, that's what I'm waiting for him to see it. He just got it. Yeah, it's a, it's a study on the impact of the nuisance, and I think that's appropriate as long as they're doing a study. You might as well find out what's going on. Okay. Senator Scoy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I'll be supportive of the amendment to the study. I was just curious if Mr. Knopf could tell us where, what is the status of the legal ability to sue over nuisance in egg country. I thought we made some changes a couple of years ago about dealing with dust and neighbors that had moved into the area or something. Did we make some changes to that four or five years ago? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Scott, you made changes in the regulatory framework for that, but you didn't. Yes. In fact, the, the bill that's been uh, discussed, not moved very far yet, um, has been talking about trying to take care of because especially for the feedlots, you've got some special things for that clean out time in the fall 
um, and and all that. That's for the regulatory framework, but it doesn't. Mm -hmm. The nuisance doesn't necessarily apply. The nuisance is a, is a separate issue. Um, and and so we haven't. They've had conversation, but we've never really moved anything through the entire process. And there was a conversation at Senator Sparks Committee. Uh, the bill was laid on the table. Um, there, you know, just to, the other thing to, to, to mention is, I mean, there there are the current nuisance law in Minnesota only applies to smaller operations. Um, I, I'm trying to recall now. It's, it's, it's like a it's like a thousand head of cattle or a, a few thousand pigs or whatever. Uh, I don't have it in front of me right now. It's something like that. <coughs> Um, and so I think they would be protected just generally because, because as long as you're following the law. But uh, the bill that Senator, that Senator Sparks Committee was going to expand it to, to any size of feedlot, that would have been a little bit different. That's a little broader. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Ingebrigtsen, I think, and then Senator DeBoer. Who was first? Right. Well, I already called on you earlier, okay. so go ahead, Senator Dibble. Thanks. <laughs> and I called on him earlier when he asked about the A2 amendment, if the author was, are you still on the amendment, Senator I, I had questions about the amendment. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Go ahead, then, because you already asked the question earlier. So, Senator Dibble. So, um, so my question, I guess, is to the maker of the amendment. Um, when we say nuisance lawsuits, is the modifying word nuisance lawsuits or poultry and livestock farms which is the nuisance the lawsuit or the farms no these would be we would be referring to the lawsuit excuse me mr chairman senator, senator dibble we would be referring to the the lawsuits as as the nuisance lawsuits okay well mr chair uh, makes it <laughs> a little different than what mr knopf explained um because there are nuisance laws which are you know lawsuit lawsuits are filed against operations that are causing that are in violation of of prohibitions against causing a nuisance in, in communities. I mean it's hard to be for nuisance lawsuits. It's easy to be against operations that cause a nuisance that cause a difficulty in living around those farms. Um, I, I, I so a little bit familiar with some of the discussion that's occurred in Senator Sparks committee and that is an attempt to shut down the ability for citizens to bring action so that these operations conform to the law so that their life and livelihoods aren't being interfered with. Um, so I'm not quite sure what the intent and goal I is was, of I was really of the, clear of the until now, and now I'm really confused. So. <laughs> well, well, Mr. Okay. Chair, Senator Dillow, it does say nuisance lawsuits filed against poultry or livestock farms. So there, these are they're being declared, are, are being, that somebody's claiming that they're a nuisance. And as I mentioned, there are some protection in current law for some of the smaller ones from nuisance. So the farm, so the farm is a nuisance. The lawsuit is not the nuisance. <coughs> right. And I, I think nuisance lawsuits filed against uh, is clear. I, right. I think everybody here knows what we're talking so. about. Senator so, Ingram. Mr. Chair, okay, um, so um, to whomever can answer the question, who who would uh, who would conduct the study is one question. Um, would it just be the, the commissioner? I mean, would we? I mean, how, how do we know that there would be a fair read and analysis of, about you know what these impact what these impacts are of these lawsuits, good or bad? Senator, I'm not interested in hardwiring some sort of effort to stop these lawsuits. I think that is a bad idea. Senator Weber. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, at this point in time, it, it would be the Commissioner of Ag that would consider that issue as they're, st they're studying the, the livestock industry and say and, and indicate, uh, you know, what influence has that, has that, uh, that issue had upon the industry and uh, what has it stopped, what hasn't it stopped. Um, and I think uh, probably provide actually those of us here that are in decision making uh, positions a, a, a better idea of, of how big a problem or how big an issue it is out there in the industry. And and this is you're not trying to talk it, about new lawsuits. You're talking about things that have happened in the past that have been considered to be new. Mr. Chairman, this is dealing with the impact of the lawsuits. It's not saying that this is not in any way saying that they need to stop. That that this they're proposing that the the, the rules be changed at this at this point in time. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I think Senator Dibble's got a fair point here. Uh, maybe, maybe you can give us an example. I, I 
I'd like some some examples of, of from somebody. I guess he asked that of somebody, and I, I I don't know of any examples of unfair lawsuits. Is it is it is it something that that comes after the MPCA and all the all the, the, the dots are dotted and the t you know the T's are crossed and they given the okay to go ahead and is that what is that when the when the lawsuit becomes a nuisance then at that point well so I'm not clear anyway Mr. Chairman what would happen is that if at at if in, in the normal permitting process if a project is allowed to proceed uh, you know then at that point in time if there were individuals who had been opposed to, to the project for purposes you know for reasons of uh, of whether it was uh, whether they were concerned about odor whether they were concerned about the number of animal units uh, whether it was manure disposal uh, they could uh, they could file a, a a lawsuit saying that the you know, protesting the res the results uh, and the decision of the local governing authorities, and um, and uh, so that is and 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 you're obviously are you know the times you're going to see this is is some of the larger larger projects that do occur. So, so just to follow up on that, so then so then the uh, the notification you know, community notifications are all done. They're, they've all been they've been vetted. Uh, these people have had their opportunity. Uh, I guess their day in court, if you will, uh, through the through the public process, and then the lawsuit. I mean, after everything is done, then the lawsuit still precipitates, and, and that's that's what you want to find out. Find that's out right. what kind of an impact it has. On. Mr. Chairman, I mean, Senator Ingress, and that would be correct. Senator Scoy, is your comment to this issue? Yeah. Okay, to, this, to Senator Ingress's question. Yeah. Okay, Senator Scoy. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My recollection of the conversation about these nuisance laws was one person's nuisance is another person's normal farming activity. And so the discussion revolved around while well, the farmer was farming and now he was going up and down the roads making dust and the neighbors were complaining about the dust or the manure on the road or whatever it might be. It's not as much of an issue in the area where I live, but I think in the areas where the city is bumping into the farm, it gets to be contentious between neighbors. And, you know, like I said, it's what that farmer might have been doing for a long time, but the, the neighbors that are moving in think it's a nuisance. And I think that would be the point of what Senator Weber is trying to get at. And, you know, having a little understanding if that is still an ongoing concern or not, might be worth doing. I mean, it's, it's, it's a study. It's not changing any laws or anything. But I think that's the crux of the matter. Senator Scalzi. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a question regarding, I understand it's a study with causes. I'm just wondering um, if this would have to go to judiciary if we're talking about lawsuits and the effects of lawsuits. Has it been requested? Uh, well, there was no, it's an amendment, so the Judiciary oh, Committee maybe saying. didn't know okay. about that. Well, Mr. Chair, Senator Scalzi, the, the bill that was heard in, Senators in, in, in the Jobs and Agriculture and Rural Development Committee would have had to go to Judiciary because it did affect the, the rights of people to, to declare nuisance. This is a study on nuisance. I don't know that they would need to see a study uh, on, on, on the nuisance, uh, on whether or not nuisance liability lawsuits are affecting uh, livestock development in the state. Let's, let's do it this way. We'll lay it over for possible inclusion. If we hear judiciary wants it, it won't be in the omnibus bill. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all. Sure. Okay, Senator Dibble. Uh, well, uh, well, Mr. Chair, if, if this amendment goes on and, um, and the bill is laid over, um, um, I would like um, at some point to be able to work on some language to make sure that there is a fair and balanced examination um, because... I, I respect the perspectives that have been shared, um, but I think the the case is being, um, uh, the, you know, the, the issue is being minimized and, and dismissed as these minor dust issues. In some instances, there are some very serious harms that are caused to folks in the area, um, and lawsuits are brought after they've suffered some pretty serious and demonstrable harm. And and um, it's no secret that there's an effort on the part of some stakeholder interests around here to stop those kinds of lawsuits outright. And, and I'm just concerned that the way this particular study is situated is solely focused on the impact on, on 
the growth of, of livestock um, that is going to be hardwired towards a particular outcome. And I think you can't make informed policy for the future without understanding a balanced perspective on this subject. And I don't think we should be asking our commissioner uh, to be turning in um, a study that only has one, one particular skewed outcome as its focus the way it would be if this amendment goes on. Senator Weber. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't believe, quite frankly, that putting this in there um, uh, necessarily forces the, the commissioner to skew the results. Uh, this, uh, this is saying, uh, this is telling them to take into consideration uh, whether or not there is actually an impact caused by the nuisance lawsuits. It isn't saying that he has to, his office has to come up with a result one way or the other. If his, uh, if his study uh, indicates that, that, that his, it's not been a factor in terms of the livestock industry in, in Minnesota, then quite frankly, that's what the results of the study will show. Uh, if it's, uh, if, if in, in their opinion, as they put together the information, they have demonstrable proof that it has impacted the development of the livestock industry, then, then I believe that's what their study will show. Senator Dewell. Mr. Chair, I'd like to request a roll call vote on this amendment. Okay. A roll call is request that a roll call be granted. Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom, yes. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, I, th I think just so it is clear, and I think uh, Senator Scoy uh, touch touched on it, but the nuisance is a, uh, a legal basis of bringing a lawsuit against uh, agriculture or other parties, uh, you can have a nuisance in town. If your neighbor uh, is uh, running loud music uh, from 2 to 3 in the morning every morning, uh, you could have a nuisance at some point in time. Uh, and so I think... Senator, Senator Westrom, can I just stop for a second? We have a definition, just so we don't go too oh. much further. How about, well, how about giving you a <laughs> chapter? In, in Chapter 561, that's the nuisance chapter. In fact, that's where the existing protections are for the smaller firms I described earlier. It basically, uh, it's, it's 561.01 nuisance action. Anything which is injurious to health or indecent or offensive to the senses or an obstruction to the free use of property so as to interfere with the comfortable enjoyment of life or property is a nuisance. An action may be brought by any person whose property is injuriously affected or whose personal enjoyment is lessened by the nuisance and by the judgment the nuisance may be enjoined or abated as well as damages recovered. So basically a nuisance is what, what, what bothers people on their, their property and, 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 and prohibits them from the use of their property as they want to use it basically. And that's what that's, what that's all about. I mean, that, that's what an action would be about. Hard to believe neighbors even get along, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, and Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Mr. Knopf, because you read it directly. There's elements that would have to be met if somebody brings a nuisance lawsuit. It's kind of ironic. Um, a nuisance lawsuit can also be generally referred to what uh, we often hear uh, some case that's brought, and we all look at the facts and say that's that's crazy that they could even sue for uh, McDonald's hot coffee or things like that. Of course, they won on that one, but. Um, well, Mr. Chair, so, there's a lot of mythology around the McDonald's hot coffee. <laughs> <we'll see. laughs> yes. So, so my point, case. my Not point, uh, just so we're kind of clear on this, is to study lawsuits that are brought in the livestock industry. Uh, maybe there's not very many brought anymore. There used to be several that we heard about. We don't hear about so many. Maybe that's what the commissioner <coughs> will find out. And so I think to Senator Weber's point, uh, what's wrong with studying it? We're not changing any elements. We're not changing any legal basis of when you can bring a lawsuit or not, or making it easier or harder. And so, um, the Commissioner of Agriculture has an interest uh, in studying agriculture and the effects of that in our state. And so I think, I think this is no more, no less than just that, a report that we may want to use, we may not want to use, depending upon our point of view. Uh, but we don't know what he's going to come back with. Uh, it may indicate that it's uh, promoted agriculture in our, in our uh, certain parts of our state, not others. It may uh, indicate that it's uh, caused a lot of uh, livestock uh, family expansions to, to not happen. Uh, who knows? It, it could go any of the, those directions. And so 
Mr. Chair, I, I say that to try to encourage members to support at least studying this. Let's find out the facts or at least uh, have a review in front of us. And I think it would just be helpful uh, knowing if this is something that's been helpful, hurtful, or really not an issue in the livestock arena. And Senator Scoy kind of hit it right. Uh, one person's nuisance is another person's livelihood. Senator, and so. Senator Dibble, before we, uh, Thanks. Uh, thanks, Mr. Just one second. Um, Mr. Knopf has what might be a concern for what you're concerned about. No. Uh, well, Mr. Chair, this was an earlier concern that Senator Dillow brought up. And if you wanted to clarify the language to make sure it wasn't uh, looked at as being the, the, new, the, the, the lawsuit itself is a nuisance, I was thinking if you deleted nuisance on 1.3 and after filed, insert for nuisance actions. So it would be for lawsuits filed for nuisance actions. The impact of lawsuits filed for nuisance actions against poultry or livestock firms. That would, I think, that would clarify your earlier comment. If, if just a suggestion, if you wanted to. Correct. Well, that that makes it clear. It doesn't get me closer to supporting well, <laughs> supporting the amendment. <laughs> but but that does make it clearer. Well, so I, I don't know. First Senator of all, Weber would, <laughs> Senator Weber. Uh, would you repeat that? I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Well, Mr. Chair, on, on the amendment, the A2 amendment, 1.3, delete nuisance, and after filed, insert for nuisance actions. So it would read. Read the impact of lawsuits filed for nuisance actions against poultry or livestock crimes. I think it would clarify the amendment um, to some of that earlier discussion about the confusion about what the nuisance is. Senator Weber. I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think I would be willing to accept that, yes. So, okay, so we'll incorporate that into, this, into the Weber amendment from the A2 amendment. Now, Senator Dibble, you have some comments. Um, so, Mr. Chair, at this point, I'm not ready to support the amendment. Um, like I said, I, I, you know, if given the opportunity, if this does come back in your, in your larger bill, um, I'd like to have the opportunity to work on some language to make sure it is fair and balanced examination. I, I don't think the way it gets inserted at this point, it is fair and balanced. So I'd like to get to the place that, that Senator Westrom has just described so that I can support the examination of these lawsuits. Um, and frankly, Mr. Chair, it, 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 failing that, it would cause me to question my ability to vote for your larger bill. Because I think this push to cut off the avenue for folks to assert their rights um, to file lawsuits against nuisances that are occurring near where they live is, is a bad idea. Well, I don't think this is cutting anything off. This is just studying it. Well, it's part of uh, taking a step down that road, which has already been attempted in years past and as recently as this year. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, I've been sitting here thinking about nuisance lawsuits, and, and uh, this is going to be way off, way off track here to some, but in, in the other life that I come from, <clears throat> there, were, there were at one time many lawsuits coming from people that we would incarcerate uh, and it, they refer to it, I think, as a uh, cold mashed potato law. And, and it's basically exactly what happened here is, is that the Department of Correction, of course, overseeing all the jails in the state of Minnesota, just like the Department of Ag would be doing here, would uh, had done the research on just what these nuisance lawsuits were that these county sheriffs were having to put up with because they're, uh, and they called it, they referred to it as cold mashed potatoes. And, and uh, it's probably not a good comparison, but it, the comparison of having the Department of Corrections look into it, uh, into that issue, would be similar to the Department of Ag looking into this. So uh, I don't think it would be anything that would be real bad. So, Mr. Chair, Senator Ingebrigtsen and Senator Westrom have made my exact point. There is a foregone conclusion that these lawsuits are not warranted. So clearly, the, the, the rationale for going down this avenue is to try to limit limit them, there is a foregone conclusion that this is where we want to end up. That's why I would like some language that makes sure that this examination on the part of the agency is balanced. See what the agency has to say. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, I, I just wanted to comment on uh, a little <coughs> bit of uh, precision and language. Say, so, say your name. Say your name. I'm sorry. Santa Cruz, Minnesota Department of Ag. So as Mr. Knopf correctly uh, read, nuisance lawsuits are a specific thing, a cause of action in the law. I think what I think the term of art that's getting missed here is frivolous lawsuits. I think uh, the committee, some members may be using them interchangeably, and we would not be making any determination whether or not these nuisance lawsuits were frivolous or not. <coughs> that's something for the courts to do. We would be studying the effects of nuisance lawsuits on the industry, an economic impact one way or the other. Uh, the, the merits of the case, whether or not it would be considered to be frivolous, is it would not be our purview. Senator, Senator Scalzi, you had. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, I, and I'm, I, 
from from what I'm hearing is that it, maybe we're not balanced enough. So I mean, there would be an impact from a, a lawsuit of nuisance actions, but there might also be an impact of nuisance practices from poultry and livestock farms, and maybe that would help to put that in there. Uh, for instance, it would say included but not limited to the impact of nuisance lawsuits filed against or nuisance practices of poultry or livestock farms. There, there might be a, a poultry farm that is doing something that another poultry farm might not like. And coming from a farm, I don't know, you know, we weren't that close, so I don't know what it might be, but uh, somebody raising wild game maybe would be creating some sort of uh, access for some of the things that are troubling the turkey farmers. I don't know, but I mean, there might be nuisance practices that would be the other side of the coin of a nuisance lawsuit. And if they were both in the same language, that would be a more balanced action, more balanced amendment in my opinion. Do we have any kind of nuisance practices that we know of? Uh, Mr. Chair, members, there we would probably, and this is this is on the fly, but we'd probably be looking for places where a nuisance uh, a nuisance lawsuit has prevailed, where there's actually been some independent finding that uh, that an operation was in uh, wasn't either a, pi a public nuisance. Um, and again, uh, not to get too deep in the weeds here, but there is a big difference between a public and a private nuisance lawsuit. Uh, so it behooves uh, the committee to understand that. What we'd be looking at would probably be public law, public nuisance, uh, as uh, private is not something we'd be in a position to really uh, evaluate, independent of a third-party judgment, one way or the other. Okay. So on the A2 amendment, Senator Cohen, you got any further comments? No. Please. Okay. Uh, <laughs> secretary, <laughs> clerk, what are you, clerk or secretary? <laughs> <laughs> Laura will take the roll. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Tomasoni. Yes. Senator Dibble. No. Sen uh, Senator Hurt. Senator Ingebretson. Yes. Senator Osmick. Yes. Senator Rood. Yes. Senator Saxhog. Yes. Senator Scalzi. No. Senator Schmidt. Yes. Senator Scoy. Yes. Senator Sparks? Yes. Senator Weber? Yes. Senator Westrom? Yes. Ten to two. Ten yes and two no. The <coughs> amendment passes and it is adopted. Um, so are there, are there any further comments on the bill? <coughs> Senator Scoy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And my comment would be to the author, I would advise you to check with the chair of the Judiciary Committee, and if he's got an issue with this amendment that was adopted, I would recommend that you remove it. Otherwise, I heard the chair say he wasn't going to include this in the bill, so probably best check with that chair. That's that's actually pretty good advice. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so with that, we'll, 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 we'll. Mr. Chairman, I'm always up for good advice. Thank okay. You. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll lay over Senate File 1271 for possible inclusion. Thank you, Senator Cohen. Thank so you. Is it yes? uh, <laughs> Senator Eakin, Senate File 927. Do you have any amendments, just in case we... <laughs> <laughs> Not on this one, Mr. Chair. So, 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 this is the one. so <laughs> Yes, you do. Mr. Chair, I do have one amendment. It's an oral amendment. Uh, would be willing to offer it. It's just a clarification really on line 1.11 where it says for farmer mentoring programs uh, we should delete farmer and uh, replace it with ag agriculture, agriculture educator. Agricultural educator mentor programs? Yes. Okay, Mr. Knopp, put that in there, right? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think that if I caught this correctly, it would be delete farmer and insert agricultural educator. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Okay. Chair. All right, then uh, 
um, Senator Eakin will incorporate that into his bill. Hmm, do we have to make a motion? It's an author's amendment. So all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Adopt it. Okay, Senator Eakin. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, this bill deals with, uh, provides an appropriation. Oh, wait, a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Senator Sparks moves the Eakin amendment to the Senate file 927. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Both motion adopted. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And the, this bill deals with, uh, or provides for an appropriation to the Farm Business Management Program. Uh, it actually does it uh, to mail C, the uh, Minnesota Agricultural Education Leadership Council, uh, and <coughs> mail C would then issue uh, funding for the Farm Business Management Program through challenge grants to the colleges that offer this program. Uh, the reason that uh, we're doing it this way is, is that uh, there have been problems with cutbacks to the Farm Business Management Program over the years. Uh, some significant cutbacks, and just recently, uh, one example up in my area, North Linn College, uh, where the, they run the Farm Business Management Program up there. Uh, there's currently seven instructors, and uh, just uh, just this year now, there were four pink slips that went out to uh, uh, four of those seven, so which would bring it down to three. Uh, <clears throat> at a time when when farmers are really relying on this uh, this service more than ever, because of the downturn in the farm economy. Uh, the farm economy tends to be counter cyclical. Uh, the general economy is, is moving in the upward direction, but the uh, farm economy has now uh, been entering a, a period of decline. Um, actually, during the times when the economy in Minnesota generally wasn't doing too well, the, the, the ag economy was doing quite well and was hel helping to hold up uh, the, the general economy. But <clears throat> as I say, now it's, it's moving in the other direction. And it's a very, very effective program. Uh, it was being cut back uh, by colleges uh, partly because of the decentralization uh, of the program and uh, being administered by the individual campuses and also because of the unified budgets uh, that were developed at, uh, at these colleges uh, where farm business management was no longer protected, so to speak, and, and so uh, they bore the brunt of a lot of the cuts that came to the colleges over, those, over uh, previous years. Um, and that's one of the reasons that we're doing it through Mail C now uh, and doing it through challenge grants. Uh, this will ensure that that money is going uh, for the purpose of farm business management, and we're just trying to prevent the further cutbacks uh, to this program. So um, the, uh, the benefits, are, as I said, are huge. Um, it, it's, it is uh, more expensive than your typical class uh, because uh, it, it can't be not like a regular class. It's, uh, it's something that's done, uh, you know, more on a one-to-one -one basis. Uh, you know, obviously, you're dealing with farmers' balance books, and, and uh, they're, uh, uh, you're, you're working with them. Uh, every, every farmer has a different uh, situation, so it's, it's, it's got to be done on a one-to-one -one basis. And it's not just the farmers that benefit from this. And I've heard from numerous farmers who have who've, uh, contacted me about saving this program. Uh, but it's also uh, farm credit services and the banks. They also have been contacting me about the value of this program. Um, and as I said, with the decline in the economy now, it's not just a matter of farmers doing good or doing better. It's a matter, in some cases, of farmers surviving. So uh, I believe that this is a, a, a critical uh, a bill for uh, the continued success and, uh, and, and future survival of the farm business management program. And with that, I do have uh, with me today uh, Jerry uh, Schoenfeld with uh, with Mail C to uh, testify to the bill as well. Do you have anything to add to that? Well, Mr. Chairman, I'll make it brief. But Say your name for the record. My name is Jerry Schoenfeld. I work with the Minnesota Association of Agricultural Educators. I just want to give you some scope of the program. There are about 2,300 students in it that are statewide. It's serviced through uh, eight different colleges within the state. Uh, the things that they deal with are, are everything from record keeping to estate planning to individual business plans and, and uh, regulatory conformity with state and federal laws and, and uh, the federal farm program and a lot of things that they deal with on an individual basis within the farm. I wanted to give you one other indication to this. Some of the changes that are being pursued by individual colleges uh, would get around, for instance, uh, in, in, in uh, the state legislature has put a cap on, on the amount of uh, per credit uh, costs that that uh, can go out to students in the Minsky system and uh, some of the proposals out there without these fundings probably would occur would change it to customized training and to give you some idea of that uh, in the year 2000 the uh, net FBM credit was $56.45 a credit 
Last year it was 173.19 a credit. Uh, they take 10 credits a year, so that's about $1,700 for the program. Some of the proposals are to take that up to two, th by turning it to customized training, would take it up to 2,000, excuse me, to 2,500 to $3,000. And so it's not. What, what was it in 2000? Uh, in 2000, it was $56.45, their net credit. Uh, and when I say net, because this legislature had put some funds into the system to pay for a portion of the uh, credits that were purchased at that time, it was a fair, it was like $17 a credit or something. And then uh, that has been taken away through the MenSQ system, through their unified budgeting process. And so that no longer exists, uh, even though we're still in the base funding that came from the legislature. And so it's now up to $173, and as I said, uh, it's likely to come without some kind of input to $250 or $300 a credit. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you is that one thing that wasn't mentioned is that out of this program comes a national database that is used uh, in speaking to uh, uh, Representative Colin Peterson as an example. When they put together the federal farm bill, they used a lot of the information that came from Minnesota's of uh, national database through this program in order to make determinations about how to put that bill together. Uh, it's also used as an example, we have several laws on the books in the state that require that far farm business management programs must be taken in order to protect the state's investment in such things as the uh, rural finance authority loan programs. Uh, it's also used by the federal government through FSA, FSA when they give out loans, they're required to be a part of this program uh, in order to ensure that they have the proper, inst proper instruction <coughs> in, in uh, the, the management education so that they can assure their loans in these areas as well. And it was indicated it's also used uh, by almost all of farm credit system and individual banks and so forth on this. Um, there has been funding that's gone into this in the previous years. Um, over the years, starting way back in 1986, so the point is that it's always been a program that has needed some subsidy from the legislature. Unfortunately, when the unified budget uh, situation came in with Minskew and the cuts were made a few years ago, all of the funds that had been put in by the legislature and the base funding were, were reabsorbed by Minskew into their general budget and that's why we're short. So we're short about two point four million dollars a year. Any comments or questions, Senator uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, just a comment and I think it was mentioned but not as strongly as it should be. I mean, yes, this isn't a benefit to the individual farmers that are participating, but it's a, really a pretty significant benefit to the state <coughs> in that they aggregate all this data and it gives you a lot of information about costs and what's going on in agriculture and agriculture is over 20 percent of the state's economy and so we have a really good understanding of what's going on with the ag sector from all of these 2300 participants they strip the identifiers out of the data and then they aggregate them and, and we utilize the state utilizes that as a information source so i think that it's pretty important to keep this going and you know i understand their concern about going through the Minsky system and going to Milsey, and I think perhaps they found a way to kind of thread that needle, but uh, trying to keep this program going is pretty important. Senator Westbrook. <coughs> Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Schoenfeld, I just want to kind of understand this for, for ourselves, but the 10 credits is kind of just a, a standard of what each person enrolling in this pays for. They don't actually attend classes each semester, but they meet often with their farm business management instructor, go through their records, be trained on, on how to keep them themselves, uh, and, and, or is there some that just pay for five credits a year and others pay for ten, or is ten just a standard program and that's how they measure it in the higher ed arena? Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator uh, Westrom, uh, basically ten credits is what they sign up for for the program. Um, the, because it's in the Minsky system, they, they have a credit system there, and right. so that's how they, they do this program. I mentioned, for instance, earlier that the other alternative to that is to go to customized training in which they would get around that in order, if they did that, they would more, probably double the cost. That was, that's been the proposal. Uh, but under the system that they have, uh, it is a, 10 credits is basically a full-time student in this program. So they do sign up for 10 credits. And the other thing I wanted to mention just quickly too was that 
that I, I didn't mention, and that was that one of the other trends that's happened was that in the year 2000, we had 105 instructors in this state in farm business management. Last year, we had 46. So it has been cut in, in half, and yet at the same time, in the year 2000, uh, those 105 instructors brought in 2,093 uh, state analysis, and uh, uh, excuse me, 2,293, and last year they brought in 2,097. So my point is that, and that means individual farms. And, and so my point is that those instructors, even though we're cut in half, basically doubled their workload in many cases in order to maintain the program. So uh, we cannot afford to lose any more. And Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Schoenfeld, um, th this might be an inaccurate summarization, but my sense is sometimes it's the younger or the new beginning farmer, and you mentioned it with some of the rural development loans or FSA loans, which oftentimes goes to a farmer expanding or a new farmer coming back and buying into dad's or mom's operation. But would, would that be a fair characterization? I mean, uh, is your, is your um, 23, 22, 2300 students uh, mostly 20, 30 year old veteran farmers, some young, mostly young, uh, any, any, my assessment is it's more, more young and starting out farmers that really benefit and take advantage of this to get trained uh, to, to run a successful operation. Mr. Chairman, Senator Westrom, there is indeed younger farmers that start in this, as, as you indicated and I indicated before. The, uh, the Rural Finance Authority loans for big young farmers and those kinds of things require participation in this. So there are a lot of younger farmers. There are all, also a lot of middle-aged farmers and older farmers that are in this. It, it's, a, it's a broad array. Uh, if you think about agriculture and how it changes over the years, uh, you know, every five years, agriculture changes pretty dramatically. So this isn't like a 19-year-old entering a college <coughs> system where they're going to graduate in four years with a, with a four-year degree. This is an ongoing, individually farm-based situation where, where uh, as, the, as, the, uh, as the program, as the farm changes, so does the structures. And, and the point is that uh, groups of farmers that are in this uh, program, they have about $1.4 billion of annual sales amongst those 2,300 that I mentioned here. And uh, that's about a $700,000 annual per farmer in, in local community. So it is an investment kind of situation here. But as you know, farms have changed in the last 20 years where uh, size has changed, even employment situations on the farms and so forth. And so it changes over time. And my point being that, that farmers do stay in this program for a long time as their farmers. It's not the idea of getting a degree in some sort. So the average age, it is, it, it's all across the board. Yes. Okay. Senator Weber. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to comment. Uh, Senator Scoy mentioned about the importance of this data for, for state purposes. And in my, uh, my real world uh, life and job, uh, and I appraise farms and, and farm operations, um, sometimes if you have a situation where you, you, for some reason, don't have readily available the subject data, per se, as to their history and, and what have you, uh, it's a pretty much an accepted fact that, that in terms of the industry, that if you go to the the numbers, the average numbers that are utilized and that are developed through this program, uh, that you have a sound basis uh, on which to make some some judgment calls, and, and that uh, the industry itself places that kind of importance on that data. Okay. All right. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, then um, we'll lay this over, Senator, you can for possible inclusion. Okay. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And Senate File 618, Senator Eakin. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senate File 618 deals with uh, industrial hemp, uh, legalizing <coughs> the research of industrial hemp in Minnesota. Yes, I, I, as far as just a little background, industrial hemp uh, has been grown in the United States uh, since the first European settlers arrived here in the 1600s. Senator, Senator Eakin, why don't you pull that microphone a little closer? Perfect. Uh, as I say, industrial hemp has been grown since uh, European settlers first arrived. Uh, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams all grew industrial hemp and uh, actively advocated for its commercial production. Hemp was a, a staple crop in the 1800s. Uh, 
it's reflected in the name of uh, some towns like uh, Hempfield and Hempstead. Uh, and uh, also hemp was handled by the U.S. government like any other agricultural crop at that time. Uh, there, and uh, during World War II, more than 150,000 acres of hemp were cultivated as part of uh, the USDA's Hemp for Victory program during World War II. We even have here some pamphlets where they were uh, for 4-H clubs to showing them how to grow industrial hemp uh, for victory in, in World War II. Uh, there's been some confusion uh, between industrial hemp and marijuana uh, over the years, which is what has resulted in it being classified as a narcotic uh, drug and, and, and uh, I've uh, often likened it to, uh, because of its appearance, uh, it is related to marijuana, but it's not marijuana. Uh, the federal government has now recognized that fact in, in law uh, in the 2014 Farm Bill. They did uh, classify uh, industrial hemp as, as, uh, as having a, a THC level of below 0.3 percent. So, and that's the psycho, uh, I guess, active component that, uh, that, that results in people being able to get high. Marijuana is, is much, much higher than that. Uh, because of that, uh, we now have the ability to grow it for research purposes. The federal government said that we can grow it for research as long as it's certified through the Ag Department. Uh, research can be done at the colleges and universities, but again, it has to be uh, administered through the Ag Department. Uh, I think uh, it, 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 we... Uh, we do import a lot of industrial hemp-made products into the United States. Uh, in 2012, the annual retail sales of hemp-made products here in the United States was about $500 million. Uh, just recently, uh, they've said now it's gone up to $625 million worth of hemp-made products. So it's, it's on the rise. And uh, you know, my thought is, why don't we produce it right here in the United States instead of importing it? And Minnesota, I mentioned how during World War II uh, that there was a significant amount of hemp being produced for the war effort. Minnesota was one of the biggest producers uh, in the country. Uh, our area is very conducive to growing uh, industrial hemp. As a matter of fact, the northern portion of the state especially includes North Dakota. North Dakota's moved forward on this as well. They've been promoting it uh, very, very actively uh, and uh, have actually passed legislation that even goes a little further than ours does. Ours uh, simply goes as far as is what the federal government will allow uh, and hopefully gets us in a position where if it is uh, legalized for large-scale production, we'll be in a good position to take advantage of that. And, uh, and so um, we, uh, as far as the, the potential for this crop, it's one of the most versatile crops there is. Uh, it uh, can be used for uh, producing paper, uh, clothing, um, Air products, uh, uh, renewable fuels, concrete, insulation. Uh, there are numerous different uses for it, and I think the research of this crop will probably result in even more uses for it. So, uh, so again, a, a very versatile crop, and uh, the, um, I, there is an amendment that we, uh, we have with this bill as well, so I, I, we could... Uh, this isn't an author's amendment, so somebody else would have to offer it, but it's the A3 amendment. I could explain that very quickly. Uh, let's, let's get it passed out because this is, this is um, even though it's your amendment, this is not the same as an author's amendment because this is the right. second engrossment. So let's just let the, let the committee get it and then uh, this is the A3 amendment that you want? That's right. correct, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> okay, go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what this amendment does, uh, for one thing, it, it does affect the, uh, the fiscal note that you have. Uh, the fiscal note does include a fiscal note from public safety. Uh, and uh, the first part of the amendment deals with that. Uh, it changes the language in such a way as to uh, remove that fiscal note. Uh, the BCA uh, has said that uh, with that language change, it really doesn't change the substance of the bill, but the way it had been written uh, could be interpreted to mean that the BCA would have to be doing uh, testing on the THC levels of all marijuana cases, and that would be a sub substantial cost to that. 
but we changed the language in such a way as to uh, remove that concern so that they wouldn't have to be doing all this testing. Um, and uh, that was the reason for the first part of the amendment. Uh, the second part of the amendment, uh, where, where it says, uh, I guess on lines 1.2 and 1.3, uh, the second part of the uh, amendment just uh, gives greater flexibility to the Ag Department to contract with public or private entities for testing. So that they don't have to buy their own testing equipment, uh, and that also will affect the fiscal note for the Ag Department portion of the fiscal note. Uh, if you notice on the uh, Ag uh, fiscal note, it does have a hundred and eighty thousand dollar cost that would be for the testing equipment. Uh, it is possible that if they can contract out, that could reduce the cost because they won't have to buy the equipment. So that's the amendment. So, uh, Senator W, you're moving the amendment. Sure. Yeah, I thought it was on the bill, but I'm not. So I'll be on the amendment. <laughs> okay. All right. so, uh, so Senator Dibble moves the 83 amendment, uh, and you didn't have comments, right? You just no, yeah, just moving the amendment. Senator Ingebrigtsen? To the amendment. To the amendment. Senator, um, the uh, line 1-5 on the amendment, research and contract with public or private, you just mentioned that. Who would who would that be? Who would be the public? I know the BCA does the testing, but who, who in the private sector would do the testing for the... Uh, well, uh, for the farmer, if this were to happen, Mr. Chair and S Senator Ingebrigtsen, uh, the health department or the University of Minnesota, uh, and I'm not sure if they have their own testing equipment, but they do testing, and they may actually have, you know, a private uh, entity that does some of that work. Uh, I don't have the details on that, but I, I, I know that uh, that I think the health department, and the University of Minnesota, might be possibilities as far as doing such testing. And if there's somebody here that could testify directly to that. Uh, you know the answer to that, Senator Dibble? Uh, just a guess. I don't have the answer. Um, but it occurred to me when I was looking at the amendment that um, the Department of Health is um, approving lab, private lab operators uh, for the purpose of administering some of the testing requirements under the medical cannabis uh, law, the newly enacted law. So quite possibly could be those labs. Okay. Yeah. Senator Ingebrigtsen? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And you mentioned the quantitative measurement of hemp versus marijuana, 0.03 percent. Uh, it's quite it's quite interesting. Uh, so there, there's no variation be above that, is what you're saying. The hemp that's being grown now, either throughout the the nation or the North American continent, is not to exceed. There, it does not exceed 0.03 percent. Is that what you said? And, uh, Very much. Mr. Chair and Senator Ingebrigtsen, I believe that that's correct. I mean, it cannot exceed the 0.3 percent. And marijuana is much higher than that. I've heard anywhere from 5 up to 25 percent or uh, THC level. So there's a significant difference. In, and it's the federal government that put this, this cap on. Uh, and I think they put a cap on it. it was very low just to ensure, you know, that. And, and just one more question to the amendment, Mr. Chair. Uh, maybe this is directed to you. Uh, we're, we're changing, taking from the 152.01 uh, statute here, we're changing that in a finance committee. Do you think that needs to go back to judiciary? Um, with this, um, with I, this I don't know that. Well, so. no, but Senator um, Ingebrigtsen, uh, that. We're not going to worry about that. What's going to happen here, according to Senator Eakin, and I think staff agrees that if we put this amendment on, there won't be a fiscal effect. So we'll pass this out of here, and then it'll go to finance, and then and whoever wants to deal with it after that can. So, so, so there wouldn't be a physical impact to this amendment, you mean? This this amendment will will eliminate the fiscal impact of the bill. Some, oh. most of it. Yeah. Um, Mr. Okay. Chair, the egg, the egg department's portion still yeah. would be okay. in effect. It's the public safety portion would, yeah. would be eliminated. Okay, so it's possible public safety may want to see it. So we'll, we'll pass the entire bill out after we put the amendment out. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Mueller. Um, I was just going to, Mr. Chairman, I was just going to clarify there is still uh, provisions in the bill allowing the Department of Egg to set fees to cover their own cost for implementing this bill for the registration and stuff. But what the amendment um, has done is um, taken the cost of the Department of Public Safety out of the bill. Um, we could have it submitted new fiscal or something after that, after the amendment goes on and in the Finance Committee to see if that's actually the fact or not. So. Okay. So that's Senator Ingretson. So, so again, that brings up a good point, uh, Mr. Chair. In the fiscal note, the Department of Public Safety is is actually being utilized. 
uh, at the cost of a three hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So that's going to go away with this amendment. Then is that what you're saying, uh, Mr. Mueller? Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ingebrigtsen, that is what is being proposed. Yes, that the that the amendment is taking the cost to the Department of Public Safety out of the bill. I don't have a new fiscal note verifying that or having them sign off on that yet, but that is what is being discussed here. That the amendment would take the cost to the Department of Public Safety out of the bill. Okay. So any further comments on the A3 amendment? So Senator Dibble renews his motion that the A3 <coughs> amendment be recommended to pass. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. 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 Uh, any further comments or questions? Senator uh, mm -hmm. Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Eakin, so mm -hmm. if I understand correctly here, the Department of Agriculture would be authorized to study and research this, grow it, uh, but they would use private landowners in, in most or many cases, if not all. And that's how a farmer in my district, for example, that might be interested in this uh, would, would be able to raise some of this. Is that correct? And then what would they do with the, what could they do with the products? So, if they raise it, would it just be for seed for future use, or could they sell it to somebody to manufacture or export it to another country that can process this? And then, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, that that is correct as far as the it would be private farmers that would be producing it, but they would have to be certified through the Ag Department in order to do this, uh, and uh, so they would be closely monitored. And as far as the uses of it, uh, the Ag Department would determine. Uh, uh, along with the research facilities, uh, what type of research would be conducted on, on, on the hemp. It wouldn't just be the seed, it's also the fiber that would be used. And, and uh, um, so uh, the fiber obviously is used for things like the clothing and, and uh, uh, for paper and things of that nature. The seed is used more for the lotions and, and, uh, and for cooking and for food supplies and things like that. So. Um, but uh, it would be, again, the Ag Department and the research uh, uh, facilities and institutions that would de determine uh, what kind of research would be conducted on it. Mr. Chair, Senator Eakin, so is the research kind of the buzzword, if you will, or the path to, I guess, try some of this out and see? I mean, we know it makes clothes. We know it can make chips. We know it can make string or twine or rope. Um, from past experiences, the research is going to go on, but that would be also what would allow the f individual farmers to try to recover some of their costs or make money on this. Is that kind of how it would work, or or would what I'm what I'm struggling with is where would there be any money in this? Just by researching it, the average private landowner isn't going to have the money to just raise it for the fun of raising it. Well, and Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, obviously they would be paid, you know, by the research, uh, you know, institutions for the, the, the product that they're producing uh, for okay. that research purpose. Um, and as far as other research, I've, like I said, I don't know the details of what kind of research would be conducted, but uh, I suspect there could be some research done, too, as far as uh, the potential marketing of such products uh, that are being produced, as well as, you know, possible other uses for uh, industrial hemp. And there may be some others that can testify to that. I have Tom Peterson here with the Minnesota Farmers Union uh, who are in support of the bill as well. And he could probably answer that more directly. Mr. Peterson, just say your name for the record. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, my name is Tom Peterson and I represent the Minnesota Farmers Union. And uh, we do support this bill and worked on it for many years. And as Senator Eakin said, the real game changer from this is the language that was passed in the 2014. Uh, federal Farm Bill, which allows these type of projects. And that's why you're kind of seeing like a, a mini gold rush of states uh, moving to pass this legislation. Just in the last couple of weeks, North Dakota, Missouri, Alaska, New Mexico are joining Kentucky and Colorado and looking at and doing this and moving it forward. Um, a couple of just quick points is uh, uh, the pilot project is important. And, and University of Minnesota, I think you have a letter from a Professor uh, Wavling at the University of Minnesota. He's one of only three uh, DEA-approved uh, researchers, and so Minnesota already has a leg up if we were to approve 
and put this pilot study into process. He has a lot of interesting ideas. Some of the things we've seen in other states are, you know, seeds. Seeds are a big thing, uh, soil availability, uh, marketing. A lot of the concerns law enforcement might have we can address in some of that pilot uh, project. And so I think it's, it's a very important, and I, I think that, you know, we see, uh, they just go north of Senator Eakins District into Manitoba, and you see them growing it there with no problems with uh, uh, crossover with marijuana. They've been growing it for many years. Last year, Canada grew about 60,000 acres. And, um, you know, they grow it, they make all the stuff and export it here, and we buy it from them. And so we think this is the first step to leveling the playing field. Thank you for your consideration. Senator Ogbeck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To Senator Eakin or the testifiers, the uh, industrial hemp has a much lower level of THC that's known. Um, is there any concern that going into the future, being, you know, Minnesotans are a rather industrious lot, that it's entirely possible that we could start down the route of industrial hemp with low THC and then suddenly see um, selective breeding, uh, I mean, that's how we get better soybeans, better s corn, that we could start to have that type of selective breeding take place and they could take industrial hemp and move it towards something that could be used as a drug. And, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Osmick, uh, under this bill they would not be able to do that and under federal law they would not be able to do that. And, and uh, under this bill there would be close monitoring of all, you know, the, the industrial hemp that's being produced and making sure that the seed being used is the seed that produces that type of industrial hemp that will be below 0.3 percent. Mr. Chair and Senator Osmick, too, and again, I just reiterate in Canada, you know, they've inspected in Manitoba 95 percent of what's been grown there since uh, 2000 and have not had an incident. When they first approved it, they would find paths or people would go in and try to steal it out of the farmer's fields and then people would realize that it had no value and that stopped after the first year or two. That was the only problem they've had. They've never had problems with, uh, uh, you know, growing in the field or anything like that. So, and as, as Senator Eakin said, it would have to be uh, regulated and uh, you would be licensed and background checked, so. And, uh, and, and Mr. Chair, I just thought I'd mention as well that as far as, um, you know, marijuana being grown anywhere near industrial hemp, uh, no one would do that because it does cross-pollinate since it's related and it would uh, destroy the quality of the marijuana crop as well as destroy the hemp, so. <laughs> well, and the argument number two is a fun one too. Hemp as a threat to health and safety. And the professor says the second argument rests on the inaccurate definition of marijuana in the Controlled Substances Act. Failure to exempt hemp from the definition of an illegal drug encourages youth to seek out and smoke hemp. Any <laughs> fool who performs this experiment is immediately taught the difference. I don't know exactly what that means, but I, but I, I like the any fool part. <laughs> Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, just to be a little bit light here, uh, one might, you know, uh, a couple of years ago have those same paths going into cornfields and soybean fields for the for the commodity prices that they were growing, I guess, but uh, no. I don't think they're going to be going in there for uh, for industrial hemp. Uh, uh, to the uh, uh, Mr. Peterson, with regards to your, your comments, uh, seeds. I I, uh, I I don't know if you if you've dealt with this or if you've thought about it. I'm sure you probably have because apparently this has been talked about by the egg community for a long time, which I'm not aware of. I've never had anybody come through my door and say I want to grow hemp in Minnesota in the nine years that I've been here. However. When we talk about invasive species, we, we, we're very concerned about that, not, through, not only through, the, through our aquaculture, but also for our, for our uh, plants, plant life, uh, aquaculture, as well as, as noxious weeds. When this, have you, have you done some research at all as to where these seeds will be bought? Does it have to go through some type of a, a, a grading system to allow that to come into the state of Minnesota? Is there a danger area there of, of, of possibly bringing some in. Mr. Mr. Chair, Senator Ingebrigtsen, uh, two comments on that. I believe they, ha they have to be approved by the DEA, um, and, and some of the states have, have had issues in trying to get enough seed imported from Canada or Europe that uh, will work, and so that is one of the important things, and that's something that our professor, uh, I always gonna say his name right, Weibling, has been working on. In fact, Minnesota, one of the things he's been looking at is Minnesota, and I believe it's actually up in your area, 
there is a lot of uh, wild strands of, uh, of hemp that still grow from the 40s in different places. A lot of people, since we've been working on this bill, will tell us where they are. And he, and he, one of his ideas is to gather those strands that have, you know, stayed all these years and made it through the Minnesota uh, weather to look at that. Another thing is uh, industrial hemp was on the noxious weed uh, uh, list in Minnesota for a number of years and uh, it was removed uh, I think about five years ago uh, at some point and so it's not classified anymore as, as a noxious weed by our Department of Agriculture. So and I know we're, we're and I appreciate the uh, uh, latitude here Mr. Chair but we're expending some state dollars here and I'm, I'm just wondering uh, where is the where is the uh, the uh, the tonnage of, of hemp go? Where does it where would it go if it was growing here in Minnesota? If it was found to be viable, where would it go? Where would they? You know, we have a canola plant in Kitson County. We bring canola there. Where do we bring hemp to have these these production uh, this production done? Mr. 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 Chair and Senator Ingebrigtsen, um, I think that manufacturers will follow where it's being produced, and uh, so we don't know exactly where you know uh, manufacturers may locate. Again, this is a very limited bill. It's just a pilot project, uh, so it's it's not going to be you know produced on a mass scale as of yet. Although there is the potential for that uh, in Washington right now, there is a bipartisan effort uh, that's that's uh, moving forward to uh, try to legalize uh, large scale production of industrial hemp. Uh, and uh, I know the, the authors on it include uh, Senator Franken's on it. That's uh, so is Senator Mitch McConnell, uh, Senator Rand Paul. Uh, they're on that bill. So um, so there is that potential in the future and I think you know where the manufacturers may locate uh, We don't know the details, but they would locate near where it's being produced So it's not just the farmers that would benefit. It's also, you know uh, Creating manufacturing work here in, in Minnesota that would follow that Pertaining to thank you mr. Chair to the to the test sites uh, In the bill description here. It says you have to submit a criminal background investigation. So uh, who pays for that and and uh, what happens if you have a gross misdemeanor conviction felony I mean who, who can and who can't participate I guess that's not real clear Senator Ingebrigts and uh, Mr. Knopf has some information on that well, Mr. Chair Senator Ingebrigts you mentioned about who pays the cost for the investigation it does say in, in the bill on 7.27 the cost of the investigation must be paid by the applicant so it's the, the applicant who pays the cost of the investigation to the to the other part of the part of the question then who qualifies and disqualifies at a misdemeanor petty misdemeanor gross misdemeanor felony level what's what's your thoughts on that I, I guess I don't know yeah, I, I guess I couldn't answer that for sure, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Ingebrigtsen. I don't know if there's somebody here who... <coughs> Check with uh, we'll Check have with to get back to you on that, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Apparently, apparently not in the bill, but... Uh, well... Dag, let's see what the department yeah. has. Santo Cruz, Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, the most recent version, I haven't seen the amendment, had rule writing authority attached to it, mm -hmm. and that would definitely be something we'd have to address during rule writing. So, Senator Ingebrigtsen. So, Mr. Chair, and, and members of the committee, I, I would think people are concerned uh, as to the threshold there of what the state of Minnesota is going to allow in their rules. I don't have a problem generally with rules. Uh, that's your area. Uh, so that's not that's not real clear. Um, <coughs> my next question, then, Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, going down the list here, to ensure that the licensed applicants must have complete, completed, excuse me, complied with the Drug Enforcement DEA agency. What is what exactly does that mean? It's in the bill. Well, it means, uh, Mr. Chair Thank and you. Senator Ingebrigtsen, that they have to comply with uh, federal law, and uh, and that. Uh, do we have a copy of the federal law? And yeah, we do. Yeah, we have a, we have a copy it's of the packet. Package. Yeah, it's in yeah. the packet. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was a one page. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Mr. Chair, um, moving further down here, issue annual licenses uh, valid through December. So you're going to have an annual fee. Uh, do you have any idea what that fee will be? Or will that will, maybe Mr. Cruz can answer that. Will that be figured out in, in rules too? Or do we have an idea what it's going to cost to grow these test sites? As far as a fee, Mr. Chair and Senator Ingebrigtsen, at this time, I don't know what the what the fee would be. So that's not reflected in the bill. Uh, 
Mr. Chair, and your Senator Ingebrigtsen, that would not be part of this. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's in the fiscal, fiscal note. note. No, this wouldn't be part of the fiscal note, no. Okay, it's in the fiscal note. I'm just saying, I'm just wondering why, if there was a one. I might be missing it someplace here when I was going through it. Mr. Uh, Senator Ingebrigtsen, Mr. Mueller. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ingebrigtsen, on page 8 of the fiscal note, the department outlines some potential. The fees aren't set exactly in the bill. They would be set in rule, but they would set the fees at amount to cover the cost of the program, and that maybe now has changed with the amendment, but to propose some assumed fees, you'll see on page 8 in the middle under the boxes, um, approximately $72 an acre or $1,800 a site or up to $4,300 for a licensed grower. That's based on some pretty broad assumptions by the department on how many would participate. But the fees would cover the cost of at least the Department of Ag for implementing the program. Yeah. And Mr. Chair, included in those fees then would be the testing of the of the content, the THC content. Is, is that how it... That's why that we're talking in such a variance here between $72 an acre to... 1800 per site, I guess, depending upon the site, how many acres that is. Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Ingebrigtsen, what we'll have to do is get a new fiscal note based on the amendment, because the amendment changed some of those uh, testing requirements and supposedly would lower some of these costs, I think, with the lab equipment and things like that. So I would assume the fees would go down under the amendment. And Senator Ingebrigtsen, said under long-term fiscal considerations, there's some pretty broad parameters there. So mm -hmm. you know, if you take a look at that, you'll, you'll see them. Uh, Senator Dibble. Um Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I just I, I wanted to respond uh, t to a, a couple of things. Uh, one item raised by Senator Westrom um, asking about, you know, who's, who's going to be growing this and who's going to be making money. Um, for the time being, um, you know, it's, it's, the bill is fairly clear that it's the, the commissioner who's authorized to grow, um, working with uh, institutions of higher learning, so research facilities, um, and that's consistent with the federal law that was passed out to us. Um, so, so for the time being, this is confined just to the commissioner working with uh, research institutions contracting with I think Senator Egan kind of described that earlier, contracting with folks to, to grow. Um, but this is really, um, really focused on um, performing research into the potential for uses of, of hemp. So that, that's very clear. I mean, I, but pulling no punches, um, the idea is that eventually this would give way towards more commercialization of the commodity, you know, into, into secondary uses. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen, um, uh, maybe you already saw this, um, line 7.21, uh, folks who are doing the growing um, are required to undergo a background check. And then to Mr. Santos's point, that language is specifically in the rulemaking um, elements on section, two point, uh, section 25, lines 8.15, using the results of background checks required um, to approve or deny a license application. So um, the, the background check will inform whether or not folks are given permission to grow. Mm -hmm. So that is addressed. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, um, I guess Senator uh, Ingebrigtsen covered some of it, but uh, Senator E can, and, and maybe the department uh, could just offer a little more insight. Who, who do you think wouldn't qualify with a background uh, check? And and for for what reason? And I'm, uh, it begs the question about, do we really need a background check, or, or what are you trying to accomplish with the background check? Somebody that's maybe been in, convicted of drug use, illegal drug use, um, is that the concern? But if we've got a THC level below <coughs> 0.3 and there's no effect of it, what I don't see quite the connection uh, if, if, if both statements are, are accurate. Identify yourself for the Mr. Record. Chair, Senators, my name is Anthony Cordelette, and I oversee the Noxious Weed Program for Department of Ag and also have uh, been working with Industrial Hemp. I wrote the <coughs> Industrial Hemp Research Report that kind of kicked off this process this session. Um, it's, it's really hard for us to, at this point, for the department to say 
anything about uh, who would qualify or who wouldn't because this has never been done. Um, we have virtually no example in the United States right now to use as a process, although Kentucky and Colorado are starting to get into that. Um, the process that we would probably follow right now is Canada, um, which has been doing this for, um, I think, since the mid-90s. However, their laws are different. Um, so when it gets down to the specifics about what if a background check comes back with a gross misdemeanor, who sets that, I would think that the department would be working with uh, the sheriff's associations as well as the other police associations in the state to help set those rules uh, to determine what level uh, we would allow somebody to be certified for uh, production or not. Mr. Chair, I guess to the department and Mr. Senator Eakin, I mean, it might be a part of the bill you, you could get rid of potentially, um, but I'm just, it, it, it looks like maybe more bureaucracy than what we would need. If we, don't, we don't do a background check on a corn farmer and say, well, if you've uh, been convicted of a DWI, somehow we're not going to allow you to raise corn or assault or some other crime. Uh, I'm just trying to understand the connection of why we would do a background check on, the, on, a, on a farm product like this at all, and, and it might be a way to just get rid of some paperwork and expense. And uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, I would uh, tend to agree with you. I, I think it was put in here for comfort language, basically, for those that were concerned about, you know, the, the, the I guess, uh, uh, the possibilities, you know, of, uh, uh, that, uh, of, of uh, uh, creating problems that law enforcement was concerned about. For instance, so, um, but certainly, I, I think uh, you know, I would certainly be open to the idea. Of, uh, but I think it was more comfort language than anything else. So. Senator Ingebrigtsen, one last question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to the uh, testifier, Cordell. I'm sorry, Cordellet. Cordellet, yes. Cordell. Uh, when did you do your research uh, on this? Go, go back again to when you said you did did some pre-research before the before the. Before yeah. today, Mr. Cordley. Mr. Chair, Senators, uh, we've we've done two different research reports uh, over the years for this for the legislature regarding this. Our first report that I worked on was in 2010, which looked at how other countries are enforcing their laws on their industrial hemp programs, and then most recently we were assigned the task last session to study. Um, uh, the interest of institutions of higher education in Minnesota for doing research as well as the interest throughout the United States of how other states will be implementing the new Farm Bill provisions. Thank you. And, and the new Farm Bill came out when? Mr. Chair, Senators, I believe the new Farm Bill came out at the end of May, sometime around there last year. All right. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Senator Westrom. Mr. Mr. Chair, um, maybe Council could help me. I, I was looking quick. To, what section would we just have to strip out to get rid of the background check section? Well, um, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, I think you'd, you'd have to do it a couple of places. You'd, you would need to, um, um, you, you'd need to uh, take out subdivision two, I think, on uh, on page seven. But then you would also want to um, delete. Um, on page eight, you'd want to delete the uh, uh, clause three by using the results of the background check. I think if you if you took those things out, um, I think that would take care of it for now. That's what I'm seeing right now, Mr. Chair, Senator Westman. Mr. Chair, just for uh, for discussion and, and I think to simplify the bill, I would move that amendment if Mr. Knopf can make it as an oral amendment. Let's get the opinion from the author. Senator um, and uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Westrom, I would myself consider that a friendly amendment. I, I don't know if uh, law enforcement would have any concerns with that. Uh, I, I agree with you, though, uh, Senator Westrom, that I don't think that it's it's really necessary. Senator Scalzi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I just was noticing that this bill has gone through three committees already, including jobs, ag, and rural, and also judiciary and state and local. I've seen it there. I think it's been vetted. I just don't know that we want to start putting things in or taking things out. To me, 
um, growing up in northern Minnesota, there's not a lot of cash crops that grow there. I think this would be, if they're doing well with it in Canada and have since the mid-90s, I, I just think, you know, this, this small step might be good for the farming community in northern Minnesota, who, which has a really short growing season. And if, the, if this um, background check part gives some comfort to some people, I, I just don't know at this point why we would want to take it out. So you're speaking against it. Senator Ingebrigtsen. Through the amendment, uh, uh, and I at, at first blush would agree with Senator Westrom, uh, uh, a corn farmer or a hog farmer or a cattle farmer doesn't have to have a criminal background done before they do farming. And quite frankly, if this is considered uh, legal, according to the, to the federal government, one would have to say the same. But this is relatively new, folks. This is relatively new on the... Uh, uh, and changing something like this, making that, that drastic of a change, uh, you basically are okay with a felon, a convicted felon growing, growing hemp. I'm not sure how that would be perceived by the public, uh, who probably still knows that hemp and cannabis are somewhat related. So I would just caution folks to move on that, that direction is all, and I think Senator Skulls, he's probably right. We shouldn't cha be changing it, but I'm just throwing that out. And uh, Mr. Chair, and Senator Ingebrigtsen, um, I think you make a good point uh, as far as it being something new. Uh, we can always change it later and take out background checks if we don't feel it's necessary at a later date. But at this time, you know, if law enforcement in particular feels more comfortable with this language, I would prefer that, uh, that the language stay in for, for now. Um, okay. uh, I don't Chair. think there's any harm in leaving Senator the language there. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, I just, uh, I guess, I'm interested in the discussion. It, it seems like kind of a dichotomy of, of, of why we would have it in there and an example of how we big government can sometimes just get bigger. Uh, so, but I, I would withdraw the oral amendment, but I, I do point it out. I think it's uh, an, an oxymoron to, to even have it in there. And it's, so I nothing on look, we look forward to working with the author on that. Maybe maybe it does make sense to pull it up. And Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, I look forward to working with you on that. Thank you. So Senator Dibble moves that Senate File 16, 618 as amended be recommended to pass and be re referred to the Committee on Finance. Any further comments or discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Motion is adopted. Thank you, Senator Eakin. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. The activity's picking up in here, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, so my partner, Oxy, yes. or the moron? <laughs> 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 Senators, well, he and I will have that discussion. Sex hog. <laughs> <laughs> when I drive you. Especially when you need a ride. Yeah. Oh, you're right. It's so safe. Let's just do it. <laughs> Senator Saxhock, Senate File 517. <laughs> yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Uh, um, wait, before you before you start, so so we've got the room until we get done. We got, okay, so we've got through until four. So we, we, we can, we'll get through the agenda today here, just so everybody knows. And um, I think next week there's a possibility we could we could meet Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay, all right. So we could have we could meet Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. And Mr. Chair, if you would give us a little heads up on these longer meetings, I have a whole afternoon of appointments that I'm missing now, but okay. I'm going to stay right. for the committee. So our staff will definitely let you know that. Okay. Senator Saxhoff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, presenting Senate File 517, and I have the A9 Amendment. Okay. All right, and I would move the A9 Amendment. All right. Sure. We don't have a Can you guys hand this amendment off? Senator Saxog, the United Amendment. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. This amendment deletes reference to certified master logger and replaces it with logger who has completed training for biomass harvesting from the Minnesota Logger Education Program. Uh, there are only 38 master loggers uh, in Minnesota, and we, we believe that it's, uh, it's a better uh, uh, that it's a better thing for us to uh, get as many loggers as we can and, and uh, into this biomass training. And of course, the Minnesota Logger Education Program <laughs> is, a, is a very fine program. And, and uh, that being said, I, I, I think that uh, council could, if, if anybody has any further questions, council could act. Or uh, uh, Wayne Brandt uh, from the Minnesota Forest Industries is also here in case. Is there any questions on the A9 amendment? Uh, this is one for now. Do we have the proper took it out of I was thinking we're not on here, are we? Technicality, hang on. I don't think the amendment's going to fit to the first engrossment because that doesn't exist in I was wondering where we were on here. Yeah, Mr. Chair, there's a, Mr. Chairman, there's a second engrossment of 517. Why don't, um, why don't we do this then? Senator Sachs, can we just uh, kind of go to Senator Sparks and wait till we get the right bill in front of us? Because I think we've got to get it printed in there, don't we? And so maybe what we'll do is we'll just suspend this for, for a second and Perfect. get back to you after once we get the right That'd bill. That'd be fine, Mr. Chair. We get the wrong bill in front of us. So, uh, Senator, Senator Sparks, why don't you go up to a Senate file 1993? <coughs> or, or 1389, whichever one you want, Senator Sparks. Jimbo one first. <laughs> oh, do 1990 first. I'll just show you this if I can see. This is the. Are, are you ready? <laughs> we can, I don't know. We're going to we find go, out. We can go to Senator Weber. No, 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 no. I'm ready. Awesome. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I think if we, if we can bring up Senate File 1993, that would be, uh, that'd be great. Okay, Senate File 1992. Mr. Chair and members, Senate File 1993 is an effort by the entire ag community, commodity groups, farm organizations, industrial our representatives in the forest industry to address an erosion of research and education dollars directed at the backbone of our state economy. It is of great importance that we rebuild and research our infrastructure, that we have the necessary resources in place for rapid response to deal with the emerging plant and animal diseases, which is very timely. Uh, as you know, we're having a, a problem right now, a little problem in the state with uh, some of our turkeys, and that we address the issues impacting ag education in our state. Mr. Chair. Senator Sparks, you have an author's amendment? Yeah, yeah, Mr. Chair, I do have the uh, A1 author's amendment that I'd like to offer at this time. It clarifies the grant program and requires some consultation with the ag and forestry organizations. Okay. And I think you want to adjust it, right? The I believe A1 Mr. Kanoff has some suggestions, okay. Mr. Chair. So as we're handing out the A1 amendment, we'll have uh, Mr. Kanoff explain what we are about to change on the A1 amendment, which is the author's amendment. And so Senator Sparks will incorporate the change into the A1 amendment. Mr. Chair, it would be on, on uh, page 1, line 10, after organizations insert a period, delete the, the rest of the line, and the delete lines 1.11, 1.12, and 1.13. So basically that uh, it would, the, the amendment would end after organi uh, with organizations on line, line 1.10. Okay. Is that, is that it, Senator Sparks? Is that what you want to do? Yeah, Mr. Chair. Okay. All right. So Senator Sparks, this is an author's amendment. This is the first committee. So Senator Sparks moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor as as amended, as corrected, as incorporated by, by staff. Um, A1 amendment, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those adopted. Okay. Senator Sparks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. In the essence of time, then I think I'd like to turn it over to Mr. Schoenfeld to talk a little bit about what the bill proposes. Turning it over to <laughs> turning it over to Mr. Schoenfeld is not necessarily in the essence of time. <laughs> 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 Mr. Chairman, thank you. 
That's it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> All in favor? No. <laughs> Mr. Schoenfeld, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I can only tell you that the orange origins of this have got to do with other actions of this legislature over the last uh, 14, 15 years. Um, if you look back, uh, the, the primary uh, research driver in Minnesota relative to the University of Minnesota uh, is the agricultural special. And the agricultural special is in the higher ed bill. And uh, in the year 2001, the appropriation was 58 million 838 thousand. Today, the appropriation is 42 million 922 thousand, and there's been no change in that in four years. And so, because of that, there's been a lot of loss in in terms of agricultural research, and and that's really the crux of this. Uh, it also deals with two other areas, and that is that uh, when the groups that came together initially to propose this, they they looked at three priorities that they had. One was uh, agricultural research. A second one was uh, dealing with uh, the rapid response fund because that also has lost ground in the last number of years in terms of dollar amounts and the diseases have increased significantly. And the third one was uh, to do what could be done to increase agricultural education in the state for the transfer of that knowledge. And so all three of those components are within the bill. Okay. Was so that any, short enough, Mr. Chair? That was wonderful. So any, any comments, any Senator Scalzi? Thank Senator you, Mr. Scalzi. Chair. I just had a question. Uh, this is a lot of money. It's like $37.5 million. Um, and I'm wondering why, um, why we would be creating this new fund rather than um, doing some of these activities through the agri-fund that we already have. Schoenfeld. Mr. Chairman, Rep or Senator Scalzi, you said through the agri-fund? Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Scalzi, initially... Senator Scalzi. Or Senator. Well, I'm a little confused. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> Senator Scalzi, uh, initially, uh, when the Agri-Fund was initially created, there was discussion about research, and there is some language in there that does that. But uh, the Agri-Fund was basically determined by the Commissioner of Agriculture, and he chose to spend those areas, monies in, in other areas. Uh, to a large part, and so uh, uh, this bill was uh, brought forth as a to, to meet the need. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I and I uh, this bill had been. Um, I serve on the state and local government committee, and the bill had been on their schedule, but then it was taken off. And at that time, it had a board, and I just think for thirty-seven and a half million dollars. There should be a board. I, I think the House version still has one, but I'm not sure. But with this much money, I don't see any report, reporting mechanism or anything like that um, for outcomes to show what's happening with this um, $37.5 million over the biennium. That's a little troubling to me, and I'm wondering if you can answer to that. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Senator Scalzi, uh, initially there was a board. The board was comprised of uh, both major farm organizations and comprised of producer organizations, uh, commodity organizations, and, so, and one, one member from industry and one from forestry. Uh, there was objection to that board by some folks, and um, they, uh, they basically, uh, I guess, succeeded the state and local committee by uh, indicating that they want to have a different kind of board where they were in control. And what it amounts to at this point in time, I think, is that the I can only tell you the reasons for the initial board as it was, and that was that the initial board, uh, one of the reasons it had a, a lot of active uh, involvement with commodity groups was because they put a lot of private money into uh, ag research at the university. And it was believed uh, by the creators of this bill that the combination of uh, this bill and those private monies would would uh, do a great deal to increase the research capabilities at the university. Uh, and so uh, I think we've lost something there by not having those private funds uh, probably as readily commingled here as, as we are. But that was the choice that was made by the, by uh, some different people. And, and so this bill is now ahead of this. And you're right, there is a board in the House yet. And, and I'm sure this will have a continued discussion. Senator Squire, did you? Yeah, Senator Squire. Is she done? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Senator Sparks, I'm supportive of your initiative here. Um, I do have a concern, and I, I know as you move this bill forward, 
I'd like to have continued conversations with you and the advocates. Uh, my concern is that as the money flows to the Department of Ag, and I see in here you've got an emphasis on line 12, page 1, for human infrastructure, and now on the amendment you've got terms on, page, on line 3 about long-term base funding. But my concern is that if the College of Agriculture, for example, is going to hire personnel for research, being subject to a one-year grant program through the Department of Agriculture, I'm concerned about the long-term viability of that funding mechanism. And Senator Sparks, I'd like to continue to work with you on that to see if we can find something that will accomplish our common goals, because I, I'm very sympathetic to the, the erosion that has occurred in the egg specials. I understand the needs to try to put some parameters around that so they don't disappear into the general university budget. But I'm also concerned about if we are asking people to relocate to do highly technical research at the University of Minnesota, that they have the security to move here and do that. So I appreciate the opportunity to continue to work with you on that. Mr. Schoenfeld. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Squay, I just want to respond quickly to, to that comment because you and I had private discussion about this. The language that was put in today as the amendment was a specific response to your concern. And that was about the best that we could come up with in trying to address that in terms of being long-term based funding and so forth. Um, I, I'd like to read from you just one thing, um, which drove this originally to go to the Department of Agriculture. And this is a, a future ag research in Minnesota called FARM that was written by the, uh, the Brian Boer, who is the, from the College of Agriculture, as you know. Uh, and in it, as although he did not come up with this original idea, it did not originate at the university. Um, as the as as the bill progressed in the House, uh, he did respond with this document. And one of the the first tenant that he had under his considerations to make this successful was this. He said, "To be successful, the fund should not subtract nor compete." with funding priorities of the Minnesota, University of Minnesota Board of Regents. And the point of that is, uh, <clears throat> and he says, regardless of how it is structured, the intent is to be additional funding for ag research, not to displace other sources of funds. The point of that is that we felt that there needed to be some credibility to ensure, number one, that his number two point did not occur, that it simply replaced funds that were already at the university, uh, and so thus, taking it another step out there where somebody else has got a little bit of a accountability factor. And then beyond that, um, to not, not compete or to change their priorities at the university. The university has got its own set of internal politics, as you know. And uh, unfortunately, the politics of this legislature and the politics of the university are not always one the same. You know also that they have autonomy and they have a great deal of influence in terms of how those funds are, are done. And so because of that, it was put together this way in order to try and, and ha maintain some control, but actually was done in part at the suggestion of his considerations. And I'll just be brief. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Mr. Schoen Walter. I, that's not great. Schoenfeld. Uh, I agree. And in our conversations with Senator Sparks and you, I think our goals are the same. So we're going to get there. We just need to make sure that we're doing it in the best manner possible. And I appreciate your efforts in this. Okay. That uh, Senator Sparks will lay over Senate Files 1992 for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Um, Senator Sackler, you want to go back up there or you want Senator Sparks to finish the other two? It's up to you two. I, uh, well, that's okay. Let yeah. me right. get her okay. oh, oh, wait. Well, we already laid it over. So we're, is this on this one? Yes. Are you for it or against it? Uh, we support the concept, of, but we have some concerns that we would like to outline. Uh, I've already laid it over, but go ahead. I'll let you tell me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Paul Sobosinski. I work with the Land Stewardship Project, and I work with the Policy and Organizing Program. And Land Stewardship Project works on behalf of sustainable agriculture. Uh, by that, we mean sustaining the farmer, the community, and the environment. We support more farmers on the land raising crops and livestock. I appreciate the opportunity to testify I'm also a livestock and crop farmer myself. 
Uh, we support increased funding for ag research at the University of Minnesota and have a record of advocating for that. So we strongly support the goal of this bill. Past versions of the bill, Senate File 820 had a board controlling the funding that we felt was not representative of the diversity and breadth of, of the ag community. Senator Sparks chose not to pursue that version of the bill and pulled it from a scheduled hearing in front of state and local governments. We appreciate Senator Sparks addressing that concern with this bill uh, through the elimination of that board. Uh, we felt that, that board was not diverse enough. It didn't, it didn't include diversity of agriculture, didn't include sustainable and organic organizations, uh, didn't include organizations like uh, National Farmers Organization, very active in this state in terms of collective bargaining for farmers, didn't include Im immigrant farmers, and we, fe we felt that that part needed to be included. Specifically as it relates to the bill, I want to address a couple concerns that we still have. Uh, testimony on the use of the money has focused on the university, but the bill does not limit where the money can go. Lines 1.113 to 1.114 say about, but not limited to. We think it should say specifically to the University of Minnesota. Um, and this is a lot, of, a lot of money under that section to allocate in an open-ended direction. We think it should be specific. We also think that uh, the focus of the money in terms of lines 1.110 should include sustainability as well as productivity. You know, we're at a point in time right now in terms of you take corn prices, they're half. So right now corn is not cash flowing. So what we ought to be looking at when we're examining the research done at the University of Minnesota, it ought to, be, ought to inter also include productivity, but also sustainability. That the idea is that we want to keep farmers here on the land. I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, Senator Sachs, you want to go back yeah. up there? Okay, sorry, Senator Sparks. <laughs> I thought he was going to do his bill next. I think okay. Okay, so That's Senator Sachs Hogg, uh, now we have Senate file 517 in front of the committee again, and you, move, uh, you want to move the A9 amendment, correct? Correct. Okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, does anybody have any questions on the A9 amendment? I think he's already explained it. Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed motion to adopt. Okay, Senator Sachs. Thank Senate you. Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 517, Chair. second engrossment as amended. I am. Uh, uh, 517, second engrossment. This this uh, bill is a production incentive program that will help establish new industry in Minnesota utilizing forestry and agriculture materials to produce high level fuels, chemicals, and energy. Uh, with me today is Brennan Jordan, Great Plains Institute, Bioeconomy Bio Coalition of Minnesota, and he's going to give a brief presentation, answer any questions. Mr. Jordan, just say your name for the record, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Brendan Jordan with the Great Plains Institute, representing today the Bioeconomy Coalition of Minnesota. The coalition is a, a multi-stakeholder group and includes agriculture, uh, forestry, environment, uh, business groups, uh, and a number of startup companies. Uh, our mission is to uh, expand the bioeconomy in Minnesota. Uh, Senate File 517 would support uh, commercial scale production of advanced biofuels, uh, renewable chemicals, and biomass thermal energy projects in Minnesota through a production incentive approach. Uh, I, I know many of you have uh, uh, heard presentations on this bill and other committees. Uh, I will try to uh, be relatively brief and, and allow you to ask a, additional follow-up questions if there are any. Uh, it does support production in three areas. One of them is advanced biofuels, which is uh, um, you know sort of next generation uh, biofuels. Uh, also renewable chemicals, which are you know basically uh, uh, bio-based substitutes for petroleum-based chemicals uh, and biomass thermal energy. Uh, which could be, you know, wood-based uh, heating projects, for example, at, at uh, uh, commercial scale. We have worked with the uh, 
University of Minnesota Extension to conduct uh, an economic impact study. And uh, Extension found uh, that uh, this bill could stimulate the uh, uh, construction of uh, 14 new industrial facilities, which would have about an $840 million uh, impact on the economy and over 3,000 new jobs, in addition to one-time construction impact of $1.5 billion and uh, uh, about 8,500 8, uh, one-time jobs. Uh, the bill before you was amended in its last committee stop, and uh, this was uh, uh, an amendment that really came at the, as a result of a, about a year-long dialogue between uh, members of the coalition and members of the Minnesota Environmental Partnership to assure that the, the bill uh, is structured in a way that, that results in uh, improvements in, in water quality, in addition to all of the other economic and uh, energy benefits of the program. The amended bill uh, really only impacts one type of project. It impacts uh, advanced biofuel projects that would utilize uh, crop residues, so for example, corn stalks as a raw material. What the bill does is it requires for those types of projects, they have to gradually increase the percentage of either perennial uh, feedstocks like switchgrass or, or alfalfa, uh, eventually reaching 50 percent. It also uh, modifies some uh, sustainability requirements, uh, harvesting guidelines for crop residues, and it also creates a, a new working lands program that would help uh, scale up the availability of those perennial feedstocks by partnering with, uh, with landowners in, in creating a voluntary program. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, I can certainly provide additional uh, uh, information if, if uh, there are questions in, in any individual areas, but uh, I'll uh, stop now with my with my remarks. Are there any questions or comments? Senator Ingebrigts. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The fiscal note, uh, I hope I have the right one here, uh, 517, is one additional employee to the DNR, Senator Sackhoff? Uh, that's correct, Senator yeah, and, 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 and Mr. Chair, Senator, will that be ongoing then, or? Uh, Will that be know, ongoing I, or until it gets up off the ground or I mean we've been doing uh, You know I, I stand corrected that uh, one additional FTA is with the Department of Ag yeah. I'm, I'm going to turn this that <coughs> quite, uh, answer Jordan. over to uh, Mr. Chair Senator uh, Ingebrigtsen uh, the fiscal note we've received is I believe for about eighty three thousand dollars And I am not sure whether that re represents an FTE uh, or not Mr. Mueller <laughs> Mr. Chairman and Senator Ingebrigts and members, the uh, fiscal note calls for one FTE at the Department of Ag to implement this, and then at a cost of about you know eighty-six thousand dollars, and then the remainder of the two point five million appropriation would be available for incentive payments. And then if if those aren't made, that language in the bill actually has the money then rolling over to the next gen program at the Department of Ag. So, Mr. Chair and, and Senator Saxog, this this will be an employee that will be full time employee that will be ongoing. Uh, or does it depend Mr. on how Chairman, the program? Is? Senator Ingebrigtsen, this this uh, this program is ongoing. So, so with the so with the employee. Never going away part might be a little no. extreme. But <laughs> 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 okay. All right, any other questions or comments, Senator Saxhoff? Anybody else need to testify on this? Okay, seeing no further comments, and Senator Saxhoff will lay Senate file 517 as amended over for possible inclusion in the House. Thank you. Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Senator members. Sparks, you got a couple more. You got two other ones, Senator Saxog. Which one do you want to do, Senator 1389 or? Let's do, uh, Mr. Chairman, if we could do Senate File 1389 first. Okay, Senator Sparks, Senate File 1389. Mr. Chair and members, Senate File 1389 is seeking an appropriation for the noxious and invasive plant species assistance account. In 2009, this account was created to address the issues, but it has yet to receive funding. The purpose of this account is to create a grant program for local units to assist with weed management problems and to respond to new 
infestations. The bill is supported by all the members of the Noxious Weed Advisory Committee. I do have a few testifiers I'd like to turn it over to to discuss the bill a little bit more. Mr. Chair, Mr. Um, Powers is here and Mr. Enfield to discuss the bill. Okay, whoever wants to go first, go ahead and just say your name for the record. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Tim Power. I'm with the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association, and I also serve on Minnesota's Noxious Weed Advisory Committee. When the Noxious Weed Law was originally passed in 1895, it was designed to protect citizens of Minnesota from the, quote, injurious effects of noxious weeds, unquote. 1895? 1895. Wow. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Most of the weeds were crop field weeds that reduced agricultural yields. In recent history, new herbicide technologies have improved noxious weed management in major commodity crops. During this same time, scores of new exotic plant species, especially problematic in pastures, roadsides, organic crops, recreational lands, and restored conservation lands, have become established with more arriving all the time. In 2002, budget cuts in, at MDA forced the elimination of most of the noxious weed program placing all enforcement responsibilities on local government. Counties and local governments have no specific funding for terrestrial invasive plant or noxious weed management and enforcement. In 2009, the noxious weed law was extensively revised. One provision created the Noxious Weed Advisory Committee, which provides a streamlined way for the Commissioner of Agriculture to list and delist species from the noxious weed list. The handout provided shows the plants included on the 2015 list, currently at 29 species. 12 of the species are on the eradicate list. They are the ones that are not yet widely spread and can be stopped before they really get started. A second uh, provision in the 2009 law was the creation of the Noxious and Invasive Plant Species Assistance Account within the Agriculture Fund. The purposes of this account uh, purpose was to create a, a grant program from MDA to counties, municipalities, and other weed management entities to assist with weed management problems and to respond to new infestations. Unfortunately, this account has never been funded. Western U.S. states that have both an advisory committee to assist their agricultural departments with review and listing of noxious weeds and also an assistance fund for counties and municipalities to enforce the weed laws have greatly increased the level of prevention, education, and management of har harmful plant species statewide. The need for noxious weed funding in Minnesota is large and growing. As more invasive species find their way to our state, local government budgets are constrained and support, support from crop-based agricultural interests to fund county noxious weed programs have waned. Accordingly, counties often don't have the staff or budgets to respond quickly to new threats. This lack of funding has resulted in a reactive approach to the problem where responses to issues are only dealt with when brought to the attention of a local government official by a concerned citizen. In most cases, it is too late in the process of a, to effectively deal with the species in a quick and efficient manner before it spreads into new areas, costing significantly more to control or manage. In summary, noxious weeds and other invasive terrestrial plants have a significant impact on the biological diversity and preservation of Minnesota's natural resources, uh, agricultural production, real estate values, and native habitats. A source of funding is critically needed to combat the, combat the threats of noxious weeds. I might add that the group that is pushing this bill is the non-agency members of the Noxious Weed Advisory Committee. That includes the Minnesota Association of County Ag Inspectors, Minnesota Association of Townships, League of Minnesota Cities, Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, Minnesota Association of County Land Commissioners, my association, the Minnesota Nursery and Landscape Association, Minnesota Crop Improvement Association, Minnesota Timber Industries, Minnesota Farmers Union, and the Nature Conservancy. Mr. Thank Chairman, thank, for, thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we have also with us Joe Enfield, who would like to add some comments. Anybody against it? Is Say again, it, sir. Is anybody against it? Not that I'm aware of, sir. <laughs> Are you sure you want to talk? <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be brief. Okay, say your name for the record. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, my name is Joseph Enfield. I'm a senior environmentalist and county agricultural inspector for Carver County, and I'm here representing the Minnesota Association of County Ag Inspectors. Um, 
as Mr. Power stated, we really don't have budgets for uh, <coughs> at the county level for these programs. This money is going to help us uh, control and eradicate weed issues that we have in our counties. We have already got a, a network uh, with our uh, township supervisors who are the, the weed inspectors at that level and the city mayor. So we've got working relationships, relationships with them allows us to work closely with them and get after um, any weed issues that we may have in, in their areas. Um, the money is also going to help and put all the counties, all the county ag inspectors on more of a level playing field, we think, being able to have access uh, to funds to deal with the uh, noxious weed uh, issues. Um, I guess at that point, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and answer any questions Senator, you may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe somebody can answer me just exactly how does it work? You have $500,000 in an account. How does, how does a township or a county access that money? Is it, a, is it a real issue? Well, at this point, that will have to get filtered out with uh, Department of Ag, and um, I, we would uh, uh, hope to uh, work with them at creating uh, a program to uh, do that. But I think the intent would be uh, the county ag inspector would be the one that would submit a request for the funds to deal with uh, local weed issues. Mr. Knopf. And, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Gimberson, also point out there's a grant program that's established in statute. I think the first witness talked about the grant program that has not been uh, funded or right. set up in, uh, in uh, 2009. Uh, but it does, it does provide for the commissioner receiving applications from counties, municipalities, weed management areas, and weed management entities for assistance under this section and in consultation with the Noxious Weed Advisory Committee award grants for any of the following purposes. And there's a whole, I'm not going to read it, it's a whole long litany of purposes that the money can be used for. Anything to add? He just, Mr. Chair, Senators, he just stole my thunder. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, Senator Sparks will lay over Senate file 1389 for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And members. Senate file 733, Senator Sparks. Okay, Mr. Chair and members, uh, Senate file 733 is an appropriation to the Department of Agriculture to make sure Minnesota remains at the forefront of trade opportunities with Cuba. The President of the United States has taken steps to begin normalizing our relationship with Cuba, and if Congress acts, we could see continued movement toward that end. Senator Klobuchar is a supporter and held a summit on this issues last month at the University of Minnesota in, in St. Paul. Uh, food is one of the products that has been allowed to be an export to Cuba. However, there are still unique obstacles to operating in that market. Despite that, Minnesota has exported about $26 million in ag products to Cuba in 2002 and about $20 million again in 2013. Um, I believe an easing of economic restrictions could have a significant impact for farmers and agribusiness with conservative estimates an additional $20 million if we were able to take advantage of that. This money uh, would help us go uh, stay on top of the changes that happen as they happen and to keep the industry informed of new opportunities, Mr. Chair and members. It's a modest amount, but I think uh, it could be an important bill to move forward on this session as well. This is all about cigars. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Senator Ingebrigtsen. Thank you. I doubt if it's about cigars, Mr. <laughs> Chair, but uh, my question, Senator Sparks, is what other communist countries do we do business with like this? <laughs> well, oh, Mr. China, Chair and, and members, Russia. I'm not sure. I think if the, the, the U, uh, USA opens up some of these sanctions, they maybe no longer would be. And we currently are. As I said, in 2012, we did export some food to, to, uh, to Cuba. And in 2000, that was under, excuse, well. excuse me, Mr. Chair, that was under President's direction? I believe so. China. How about China? Senator Ingebrig. I don't know. Well, oh, they're communist. Yeah, I asked that question. Nobody's been able to answer. China. China? China. Yeah, they're communist. Agriculture? <laughs> Everything. Holy <laughs> man. <laughs> Everything. Steel? Well, everybody knows the rift we've had with our neighbors to the... Certainly not north, is it? South. Oh. Actually, we should be we should be selling... The, 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 the American car industry should be opened up to them so they can get some new cars down. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, that was quite uh, noticeable when you <laughs> see articles on TV, the cars they drive. I'd love to have those cars, actually. Okay, Senator Sparks, we'll lay over Senate File 733 for Thank possible you very much, inclusion. Mr. Senator Weber. No, I'm just saying...
just get it started. Senator Weber, Senate File 1302. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, pleased to bring to you uh, Senate File 1302 today. Um, as uh, you are well aware, and agriculture is a major industry for Minnesota. Uh, last year, in 2014, we had the Ped V outbreak with the uh, swine industry. This year, we're starting to see the avian flu. Uh, show up in, in our turkey industry, and so the importance of the diagnostic capability of veterinary medicine is extremely important. Who's the photographer? Uh, that's, a, that's outstanding. Who's the photographer? <laughs> I'll let the dean refer to that. Uh, but I have with me today, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Dr. Trevor Ames, he's the Dean of the College of Veterinary, Minis uh, Veterinary Medicine at the University of Minnesota, and uh, he will outline uh, the request uh, for the um, money that we have uh, in a total of, of um, 19600000 for appropriation for the Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. Okay, welcome to the committee. Just say your name for the record. Hi, I'm Trevor Ames. I'm the Dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, Chairman Tom, Tom Sami. And uh, committee members, it's my pleasure to be here and, uh, and address this committee. Um, the VDL, or as we call it, the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, is an important part of the college and its ability to uh, keep the animals of the state healthy and to keep our agricultural economy healthy. Um, as the director of the lab would say, it's the only animal health lab in the state that will drop everything to respond to an a, a new disease threat. Um, for the uh, better understanding of the committee, it is the official lab of the Board of Animal Health. So it's the official state lab for the Board of Animal Health, but it's located within the University of Minnesota, within the College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, and the article that I provided you about the college's response to the PED virus outbreak, I think illustrates um, how that uh, relationship between the lab, the producers, and the college works. Um, this is just one example uh, of, of how we can respond uh, to problems that are detected in our diagnostic lab uh, by ongoing research. And the other handout that I provided you um, basically calls attention to the important need for enhanced facilities for um, secure research where we can conduct infectious disease transmission studies at the university. So basically, um, I think the diagnostic lab is a very important part of the state's infrastructure in terms of providing valuable service. It's also the only place where veterinary students and, uh, and veterinarians get advanced training in diagnosis and pathology. And it also, as I've mentioned already, links our research programs um, with what is happening in the field. So this request um, is specifically asking for a number of things. Uh, basically, the equipment that would be provided would dramatically improve, improve our diagnostic and educational capabilities. Um, an electron microscope is basically uh, a very high-powered microscope that can look at uh, things at the subcellular level. Um, and uh, the current one that we have is over 30 years old. These microscopes can actually visualize a virus. And so they have become one of the most important ways that we diagnose new emerging diseases. And uh, we're fortunate to have one of the best uh, electron microscope pathologists in the nation, but uh, new equipment is needed. Our sample receiving area was designed over 20 years ago. And since then, we've had a dramatic increase in the number of samples. We run over one and a half million tests a year at the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. These tests not only detect new emerging diseases, but they support day-to-day -day management decisions that occur on every farm in Minnesota. And so we are in need of improved uh, sample receiving facilities to handle this uh, dramatic increase in samples coming into the lab, and also uh, enhanced facilities that allow us to have more biosecurity and more safety for our personnel when they handle these samples. Uh, Diagnostic pathologists are one of the hardest positions to fill within the veterinary profession uh, nationwide. And uh, as a result, we're also asking for improved facilities for training our students and training uh, graduate veterinarians to be pathologists um, with technology-rich demonstration areas that allow greater access to all uh, learners at the college. 
Um, molecular diagnos diagnosis or DNA testing, as, as you see on uh, CSI, uh, we call it PCR testing, has become a core part of our work. It's the high volume test that we use to detect new agents um, and uh, monitor their presence in animals and on farms. And um, um, an example of this need uh, is happening right now with the high path avian influenza in our state. Um, in order for product, market weight birds or eggs to move out of control zones, birds on the farms have to be tested negative for high path avian influenza twice, 18 hours apart, in order for that product to leave the farm. We're one of the few states in the nation that allow that to happen, but that means that we have now got expanded shifts running seven days a week at our veterinary diagnostic lab so that that product is not going to waste. And I think that's a huge economic advantage for this state. So in order to handle this increased testing within the PCR lab, um, we need improved equipment, including sequencers and improved bioinformatics sampling and analyzing to handle the huge data sets. And we need robotic instruments to also handle all the samples that are coming into the lab. And the last part of the request really deals with a statewide um, expansion of our services. We believe that we have a novel way of dramatically expanding the reach of the veterinary diagnostic lab by creating post-mortem facilities that will be virtually linked to our pathologists um, and allow technical staff in those facilities to be guided by the pathologists. And we have piloted this work um, already uh, within the University of Minnesota and with uh, um, diagnostic labs in other nations. And so we think that this would be a, a unique way to, uh, to meet this need statewide. So thank you again for this opportunity to uh, come and address this committee. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Senator, Senator Weber or Dr. Ames, um, so is, is this, this seems like a bonding request to mm -hmm. me. Uh, um, and I don't know, maybe this is, that would be a good idea to turn this into a bonding bill. But I don't know if the university is interested in asking for it from the, for bonding, but it seems to me that this might be a bonding request. So I'm just curious about what your thoughts on that are. Well, it's, it's primarily an equipment request. Um, and so that uh, was, was the question that was, uh, that was raised is the equipment that would uh, help make the veterinary diagnostic lab state of the art. And so that's what we've proposed. Okay, so it would so be one-time funding for primarily equipment. Okay, so you're not changing buildings. I thought you were changing some buildings here. It looks to me. Well, we did talk about creating some facilities in outstate. So there would be some uh, need to either equip existing facilities or create facilities. Okay. Um, Senator Ingebrigtsen. Mr. Chair, I think you're on the right track here. I'm looking at two different parts of the bill here, um, one on maybe Mr. Knopf can explain the difference, but 1.14 and 1.16 talk about facilities and a state of the art training site. To me, that's, that might be bonding. So, uh, But my comment is, I, I talked with the doctor yesterday, he stopped in my office and, and explained it to me, and, and this is something that is really needed here in Minnesota. I mean, I think the general public thinks for just takes for granted that uh, all this stuff is being done and, and uh, our food production and, and we have uh, different infectious things that come into our state and to our animals that we uh, consume or sell to other areas to consume, they should be good. And, and uh, looking at the facilities that you had there was just unbelievable. And I'll comparatively talk about the, uh, the funding that we did for Peter Sorensen uh, and, and maybe Mr. Knopf can help me with that, but I think that was a bonding, a bonding uh, thing when we did it for the University of Minnesota for <coughs> aquatic invasive species research. He had just a little niche in the corner of the university and we did a fairly extensive amount of money there for, for him. And I'm trying to think of whether that was bonding or not, but this is really, this is really needed, uh, Mr. Chair, however we get the money. Okay. And we did, he's so j one. just, uh, Mr. Ahead, Chairman, Dr. maybe I can help clarify. <laughs> Um, so there is a request for um, equipment uh, for the veterinary diagnostic lab. There's a separate bonding request for a veterinary isolation facility. I did provide you with that handout um, because I did make reference to it and how important that facility is uh, to working with our diagnostic lab hand in hand. This particular request is about only the diagnostic lab and its facilities. But once we diagnose a new disease in Minnesota, then we need to figure out how that disease is spread, how it's transmitted animal to animal, farm to farm, 
and the separate bonding request is what would deal with that. That's already a part of the university's request. It's already uh, part of the governor's bonding request. And, uh, and so I, I was just uh, providing that as context and information. Uh, I'm sorry if that was confusing. No, not. We were just trying to figure out how to get this funded because, like I said, we have $800 million worth of requests and we have a $45 million target. So, yeah. you know, bonding might be a, might well, be I, a possible I can, I can make some suggestions where to start. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate that. Um, well, I, I think it's, this is kind of interesting. Built in 1958, if you transpose the numbers, it comes out to 1895, just like the noxious weeds. And so I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway. Um, where have they been? Yeah, exactly. Um, and is there, is there a certification issue? That, um, so um, with the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, it is an accredited lab. It's accredited by a national agency. It has to be accredited every five years in order for its test to remain valid. So as an example, the high path avian influenza testing that we're doing has to be done in an accredited lab in order to allow that product to move out of the control zone. Similarly, it has, you have to make a diagnosis at an accredited lab in order for any USDA indemnification for the farms that are involved. And we also need it for, you know, to certify that we're free of disease so that we can uh, have export status to uh, nations outside the United States and even to other states. So um, yes, there is an accrediting issue for the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, and we were recently reaccredited last year. So here's a, just a, a bonding uh, appropriation that we've made in the past, and here's the language to that one. Go, go ahead, Mr. Kopp. Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, in laws of 2014, uh, there was a, a bonding appropriation to the University of Minnesota for research laboratories and included, included money for to equip the aquatic invasive species research laboratory. That's what uh, Senator Herbertson was talking about. Um, and that was included in the bonding bill as a capital budget. And we used bonding dollars for that, is my understanding. So we might, so we might be able to get equipment too. Senator uh, Scalzi. And, and, and to uh, uh, piggyback on to Senator Ingebrigtsen's uh, comments, uh, we, we looked at those labs. We looked at Sorensen's lab. We looked at the B labs. But it wasn't a U of M request. And we all felt, well, where are they? Why aren't they requesting these things that are so inefficient and so outdated? And that's the way I see this. It certainly is something that I think legislators would look at and think this is really needed, although the U of M, they should be having this in their bonding request. This should be a bonding And this avian project. influenza has been on the front page quite a bit lately. So, I mean, even I noticed it, so that means it's a lot. So, so <laughs> and again, Mr. Chair, yeah. just to uh, reiterate, the veterinary isolation labs is in the university's bonding request. Right. But I'm talking the, about this one. The veterinary diagnostic lab facilities was not, and, and that was um, a much appreciated request, yeah. Okay, Senator Ingebrigtsen. So, so I think the doctor's right here. We're talking about mostly equipment here, aren't you? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and most of the time, equipment is not bonded for, I don't think, is it? Or it can it, be, though, it can be. Like if, it. if it's, a, if it's fixed. attached. Yeah, it looks like it can be, though. Yeah, yeah Mr. Yeah. Chair, Senator Ingebrigtsen, my understanding is that, that we have bonded for equipment in the past. I'm not an expert on the rules between what can and can't. I think it generally has to have a lifespan of 20 years uh, for it to be eligible for bonding. Um, and that's. It, as long as there's improvement to, to, to public land um, or a public building, um, it's been bonded for in the past, in my understanding. Okay. Okay. So any further comments, Senator Weber? No, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and certainly um, if uh, the parties at the table believe that we should also go down that avenue, we'll work on, on making that happen. I'll, I'll tell uh, Senator Stumpf that's your recommendation that he fund this yeah. one. Uh, Senator I, I, I would appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, we'll lay over Senate file 1302 for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Weber. Uh, we're done for today, right? Okay, so thank you and meeting adjourned.